please. This is the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, June 7, 2018. The time is 7 o'clock. Please call the roll. President Sutton. Here. Trustee Todd. Here. Trustee Jesa. Here. Trustee Lumsden. Here. Trustee Ballerine. Here. Trustee Sadeby. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Molina. Here. Also present Village Clerk Haley. Not present this evening is Trustee Peters. Thank you very much. If you'll please join us for the pledge. Thank you and good evening to everyone who's here with us and those of you watching at home. Um, just a preliminary comment about this room and the acoustics. You probably heard a second, I, somebody's already saying they can't hear me. I can only speak so loud <laughs> that I'm shouting, but we'll do the best we can so that you can hear us. They can't turn the volume up anymore or they're gonna get the feedback. So I would just ask everybody up here and then if you have something to say at the podium, please just do your best to speak up so that everybody in the room can hear and see what you had to say. If you do want to address the board this evening, I ask that you be recognized by me and that you make your comments from the podium so that the folks at home can hear and see what you have to say. First up this evening, our presentations and public comment, and we have a finance department update for the 2017 preliminary report. Director Johns. board me meeting, it was requested that I provide a more detailed analysis of why fiscal year 2017 ended in the negative. General fund revenues in, the, in total ended at 98.5% of budget or 143,000 less than budgeted. General fund expenditures were 113,000 greater than budget, excluding capital transfers. This resulted in a deficit budget of $231,928 before capital transfers. First, I would like to cover some of the major deviations from budget. In Director the John, can I interrupt you just, can I interrupt just a second? Mm -hmm. Can you folks hear her? No. no? Um, I'm sorry to ask you to do this, but can we just, everybody, move up and get closer to us? Because... Th just move the chairs. Move the. Move. You can move over. You cannot. Yeah, just just slide everything up. I'm sorry to ask you to do this, but otherwise we're going to be straining all night. On the precipice. <laughs> okay, so we'll try it again. I mean, we're, I mean, I'm even having a hard time hearing from up here, I'm Director sorry. Jones. So we'll just do the best we can. Okay, please continue. to go over some of the major deviations from budget in the revenue category. The intergovernmental and grant revenue area ended at 90.8% of budget. This area consists of state per capita taxes, personal property replacement taxes, and grants. The amount of state per capita taxes also is also referred to as local governmental distributive funds, or LGDF, received in 2017 totaled $1,033,327. This represents a $130,838 or 11.24% shortfall. This shortfall is directly caused by the state enacting a one-time cut in funds distributed to local municipalities. Some other revenue areas that fell short in 2017 were police fines. This correlates to reduced manpower in 2017, 
judges not finding as high as previous years, and the state's attorney no longer prosecuting driving while suspended or revoked cases. Investment income also came in approximately 22,000 less than budget due to continued low interest rates and reduction in overall fund balance. Now I would like to move on to some of the major budget deviations in expenditures. The village manager's area exceeded budget by 15.9% due to unbudgeted contract amendment and economic incentives. These economic incentives were offset by additional revenue received in the places for eating tax area. Legal expenses were 126.2% of budget. This is a reduced of increased code amendments code enforcement and text amendment cases. The public liability insurance area was 49,494 greater than budget and this was due to incurring a large deductible incurring the large deductible for one claim. Police investigations were 117.3 of budget. This is due to promotions and high caseload. Fire training was 135.4% of budget. This was due to high staff turnover and training of new firefighters. Fire maintenance was 112.7% of budget. This is due to fre frequent and costly vehicle repairs associated with the ambulance. The board authorized the purchase of a new ambulance in May of this year. Public Works Buildings and Ground was 114.3% of budget due to higher than expected maintenance costs as a result of the village's aging infrastructure. Are there any questions regarding the 2017 financial report? Steve? I, just a quick, um, so, so uh, uh, about 60% of the differential was as a result of uh, the LGDF from the state of Illinois. I understand this latest budget um, agreement addressed that to some degree. Could you maybe help us understand what we can expect for next year versus this year? Or Absolutely. I guess this year versus last year? Absolutely. On May 31st, the state house passed their budget. This included a one-time 5% reduction in LGDF. This is not sup supposed to be compounded on last year's 10%. This will result in an approximately $80,000 shortfall in that budgeted area for us this year. And so, and just to add to that particular comment, I've already tasked village staff with reviewing our expenses year to date and where we can make budget cuts and adjustments. And so we're working on that. We'll provide a report back to the village board um, at an upcoming date. I mean, I guess the only good news is that it's a known number now, so it's easier to budget for. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One of the other items that I'm planning on presenting in my monthly financials is instead of um, accounting for this shortfall in the last fiscal period, doing a journal entry on a monthly basis to more clearly communicate that. The other area in the state budget that is to note is the um, administrative fee on locally imposed sales tax decreased from 2% to 1.5%. So I anticipate hitting this revenue item. Anybody else? Thank you, Director. While we're talking about the local government distributive fund, it's a good opportunity just for me to make a little comment about this. The, the local government distributive fund was set up in 1969 when the income tax was set up by the state. And the reason it was established was there was an original idea that individual municipalities would, would uh, administer sales taxes directly. The state decided that it would be a more efficient process if the state collected that money on behalf of municipalities and then distributed it to the municipalities on a per capita basis. So the reason I say this is to drive home this point that this is our money. The state is not choosing not to allocate something from us. The state is taking money that they collect on our behalf. So the, what we're being told by legislators, representatives this, this year is, well, we're only taking half as much as we did last year, which in my mind is like somebody sticking a gun in your face and saying, give me half the money in your wallet. So this cannot continue. You know, $131,000, $80,000 shortfall 
because of state, the state withholding money that belongs to us, belongs to you, is unconscionable. And what's happening is, and the representatives, representatives will be quite candid about this with you in, in private, they are balancing the state's budget on your back. So I want you to let your representatives know that this is the last year that they get to dip into this well because they're taking it away from you and it's going to mean decreased services if they continue doing it in the future. So just wanted to let you know that. Please. I think you misspoke. It's income tax. This is income yes, tax. Yes, income tax. Not That's correct. Tax. Income tax. Thank you, Trustee. <clears throat> Next up is the continuing discussion of the Groveland Avenue levy uh, project. Manager Francis. We have representative from both um, Christopher Burke Engineering, Orion Gailey, who is our village engineer. And we also have a representative from Army Corps of Engineers, Jeff Zucker. Um, there were some questions that had been provided previously uh, from our previous meeting in which we uh, received questions outlining various concerns that residents had with regard to the project. Mr. Zucker is here this evening to address some of those questions in addition to some questions that the board had with regard to our project partnership agreement. Um, I'll invite him up to the podium to begin addressing some of those questions. Um, additionally, with regard to Maplewood residents, they collectively provided a comprehensive list of questions for Army Corps of Engineers to address. Uh, the Army Corps is addressing them in writing, however, based on the timing of receiving those questions, they were not able to provide everything in a comprehensive manner prior to this meeting. Once I have that, we will then post it on the Village website for residents to review, and if there are any additional questions beyond that, we'll go ahead and get those answered for you. So did you have an uh, area you wanted me to start with, like the board questions or the Maplewood questions? Or? I would say the Maplewood questions okay. to begin. All right. Very good. Um, so uh, thank you all for your comments. We appreciate your time and diligence in gathering all these and sending them on. Um, so I would like to start uh, with one part of the questions that was sent to me. It's regarding um, contradictory statements that have been quoted in the paper. Um, so back in 2010, I came here for a Hoffman Dam meeting, but I was here as the Des Plaines project manager. Um, there was another project manager on the Hoffman Dam at that time. And we gave a brief update on the progress of the Upper Des Plaines Phase II uh, process so far. And these were very preliminary results. Uh, and I'd like to just kind of explain what our process entails so that you can understand why these are considered preliminary. So in the Displains, Upper Displains watershed, uh, part of our feasibility process is looking at all of the possible locations for flood walls, reservoirs, and other flooding solutions to problems throughout the watershed. Uh, our initial calculation was there was over 280 sites that we had to analyze to determine whether they would be feasible or not. So, Back in 2010, we were in the process of analyzing all of those 280 sites. Our initial analysis concluded that we were going to be looking more closely at the railroad bridge and that Groveland Avenue levy was not an option at that point in time. These were very preliminary analysis. And so uh, Mr. Uphughes quoted very correctly in that article in 2010 that that's where we were at at that point in time. Uh, that analysis continued through the 2013 flood. At 2013, we had another look at what was going on in the area, and we were more closely concerned with what actually would um, occur should we be able to do this. Um, so at that point in time, we were down to approximately 10 projects throughout the watershed. So we were able to dedicate more time and effort into closely analyzing exactly what was going on. So in looking at the railroad bridge issue and straightening the piers, um, we did conclude that it would be able to lower the water levels. However, it would not remove anyone from flooding. And so that was a concern of ours, was that we would do this project that would be millions of dollars, and it would have a benefit ratio that would probably pass muster, um, but no one would be saved from flooding. Uh, in addition, we also had close contact with the railroad. Uh, 
And after many years with the Corps of Engineers, I've come to find out how much power our railroads actually have. Uh, they are able to say no very quickly and very, uh, very well. And so they basically told us to take a hike when it, we wanted to consider working on their peers and straightening them out. Um, with that information, we took another look at Groveland Avenue levee because we wanted to be able to do something for the residents here in this area. After the April 2013 flood, it was particularly hard hit in this area. Uh, we figured that it was a good opportunity to look at it again. Uh, so we went back and re-looked at the numbers uh, and we were able to more closely look at what the modeling was actually telling us. Uh, previously, uh, it was our understanding that, that uh, the closure might cause issues. Um, basically, that was our initial engineering analysis without digging into the numbers. Uh, because there were so many sites in that process, we had to do uh, basically a very categorical initial analysis on a lot of these sites. Uh, and a levee like that with, a, um, with basically the tie-in to high ground being as it was, was concerning to us but being able to go back during the 2013 flood and look at that more closely, we found that the concerns were unfounded. Uh, so our engineering analysis to begin with, uh, we looked at it very, un not specifically, not as closely as we would like to, but coming back, we are able to look at it again. And now we have come to the conclusion that it does not pose a problem having the tie back as it is. And as, you, as uh, we will demonstrate again, in our modeling. We also took a close look at the 2013 modeling as requested. Um, we'll be able to show exactly why that is not an issue. Um, so uh, hopefully all of you got a chance. There is a handout on the table over there uh, that, takes a, that shows these comparisons and I'll be able to go through these with you uh, and look at them so that we can kind of come to uh, what is going on out here and why this is not an issue. Um, so if you didn't get a chance, uh, the fact of having a tie back going across against the river flow is not an issue. We'll show that. So, um, so this is the first page. The first page of your handouts has on it the 100-year model results, 1% annual chance of exceedance. All right, and this is the slides that we showed previously. Uh, and it, it's basically the same information that was at the previous April 5th meeting. I uh, just wanted to print it out for you guys again so you had it. Um, so you had a chance to be able to look at that. So, um, so it shows exactly the same thing that we saw before. This is, you know, the area of Groland Avenue Levy definitely floods, definitely has issues at the 100 year or 1% annual chance of exceedance. Putting in the levy, again, protects the area and does not show impacts uh, in the, the Maplewood area. So you asked us, well, what did the April 2013 flood actually look like? So I went back to my hydraulic engineers and I said, can we model the 2013 flood? Uh, and they said, sure, we can do that. Um, and so we went back and we put in the 2013 numbers. And this is what the second page should show you. It says April 2013 with and without Groveland Avenue levy. And you'll notice that these are very, very close. So I think last time we had talked about the fact that the 100-year flood uh, probably didn't quite reach uh, the level of the 2013 flood, or the 2013 flood didn't quite reach the 100-year flood. So I talked to my hydraulic engineer and he goes, no, in fact, the 2013 flood was about a couple tenths higher than the 100-year flood. So that is what you see here. That's why it's also very close. If you flip back and forth, you should be able to see it's very, very close to what, um, what we were showing in the 100 year, the 1% annual chance exceedance. Um, the part where it gets really cool is when we flip over to the next page and you'll see this page with April 2013 aerial photo. Uh, so what we did was we took, took the opportunity to compare uh, one of the cool things about my job, I got to fly over the flood in 2013 and take some pictures. Um, not exciting for those of you on the ground, but it's kind of neat to be able to see it from the air um, because it, we, this is what brought us back to our analysis of this area, uh, looking at it and seeing how much of the area was actually flooded. Uh, and you'll see one of the things that we thought was pretty neat uh, is the, the modeling shows this little fork here along uh, Forest Avenue. 
it's kind of like uh, there's two little tongues that kind of stick out uh, along Forest Avenue. And it's right next to these four tall buildings. And there's a little circle around it. There's a little white circle around it. And then you'll see it over in this aerial photo um, that those four buildings have water right next to them in almost exactly the same spot as indicated by our modeling. Um, another spot that's pretty uh, helpful for us to show that what we're showing you in the modeling is accurate, if you look at the opposite bank of Forest Avenue, you'll see that there's a patch of land there, a patch of the road that it's circled up here at the top, that is not covered with water. And this again is indicated in our model right here, that there's no water covering that portion of Forest Avenue. And one of the other things that really shows us how accurate we are, um, there's a small portion of homes right here next to that fork, that's the third circle on here, uh, that shows that there's water up in between the homes. And if you look at this picture here, um, where the trees are, you can see that there's water up in between those homes as well. Uh, so we think that this is um, pretty uh, self-explanatory in terms of what we're showing you on these pictures is actually what occurred back in 2013. Uh, we have pretty definitive proof. Um, to further uh, illustrate on the last page, there's actually a separate page. Uh, my PDF didn't work properly and they printed it well, but uh, there's a separate page that's an eight and a half by 11. Um, there's four more points, and this is right along Park Place here. So as you can see, our modeling shows uh, this home over here, completely surrounded by water, uh, and there's a circle here showing that, and as you can see from the aerial photo, yes, that home is surrounded by water. Uh, the part that actually gets us a lot of confirmation of how far this water will go, uh, we see that this big building right here in the foreground, um, there's water almost up to that building in the aerial photo and in our modeling as well. So our modeling very, very closely uh, illustrates exactly what goes on during a flood. Um, and we, I know that these were taken during the flood in 2013. I was in the helicopter with the people taking the photographs. Uh, so we are very confident in our results of our 2013 modeling as well as this illustrates how well the model accurately depicts what is going on out in the real world. Now again, these are not exact. These are models. They are close replications of what goes on, but we think that they are doing a very good job when you look at these pictures and you consider what is going on out in the real world. Uh, so that kind of goes through that. Um, there were a number of questions and I took some time to go through these questions and I talked with my hydraulic engineer uh, and I'd like to just address those questions now. Um, so one of the, the first question is the modeling presented on April 5th at the village board meeting showed ponding developing in our street. It is still unclear how the water gets here. Uh, and if you flip back to that first page of the handout with the 100 year model, what they're talking about is this little crescent shape up here along Maplewood. Um, it is not clear how that water connects to the river itself. So I had my hydraulic engineer go back and look at that. I thought maybe, maybe there's a pipe, maybe there's a low point that overflows for a time and then stops. Uh, but what we, what we discovered was that this model that we have used, it uses a one-dimensional portion of the model that then interacted with the two-dimensional portion of the model and it went over a high point in the actual ground. And so going back and looking at the interface between the one-dimensional model and the two-dimensional model, he's able to locate that area where it flowed around this high point. Um, you know, these models, they're trying their best to figure out where all the land is um, and there are things that have to be filtered out in the process. So after the connection elevation was adjusted to better represent the transition between the one dimensional and the two dimensional areas for the 2013 model simulation, the area showed no flooding in the streets during the 2013 flood stage. It came very close to reaching the elevation that would have resulted in street flooding. So we want to make that clear. It did come very close. It didn't quite get there. Uh, but because of the interaction between the one-dimensional and two-dimensional models, and that's how this is put together, 
it showed that flooding. Uh, but if you flip over to the 2013 model, you'll see that that no longer is shown on this portion that we produced for you guys tonight. Uh, so uh, with some more time, we've been able to go back and look at these things, so we appreciate the questions and the chance to look at them. Um, the second question, homeowners are very troubled at the thought of flood water inundating Maplewood sanitary combined sewer and the potential for flood water and effluent backing into their homes. Um, we would love to be able to look at this, but unfortunately this is not an Army Corps of Engineers issue. This would be a village or a metropolitan water reclamation district. Whoever you pay your water bill to, um, those are the issues that they would have to be able to deal with. Um, it's not part of our study, um, so we would have to, I'd have to turn that over to the village to discuss. Again, the next question is, are inadequate sewers compounding the effect of river flooding on Maplewood Road? Inadequate sewers is not part of this study. That would be something that the village would be addressing. Why isn't the tieback portion of the levy considered a hazard for homes on the wet side if home insurance companies do? Uh, so our modeling indicates that there will be no impact to the homes on the wet side of the tieback portion of the levy. This means that it poses no hazard for the homes on that side of the levee. These homes are also elevated to levels higher than the proposed top of levee elevation. Home insurance companies have their own policies and we do not set those. If it is in relation to flooding potential, the requirement for flood insurance is based on FEMA flood maps and the modeling indicates that the flood maps will not change for any of the homes in Maplewood. What recourse do Maplewood Road, uh, Road homeowners have if the model is not accurate and the levy exacerbates the flooding? What form of guarantees are in place if this happens? All models have sources of uncertainty. The Corps of Engineers is utilizing standard practices and best available information to reduce the uncertainty of the model results. Additional reviews like the one performed by Burke, and they will give some more information tonight later, uh, will be performed throughout our pre-construction engineering and design to ensure that best practices are followed. Uh, we will be continually monitoring the full results as we go through the engineering and design. Uh, the only recourse, uh, because the Corps of Engineers is protected by the Flood Control Act of 1927, uh, the recourse would be able to come under the Fifth Amendment. You could sue the federal government should there be impacts, um, but that would only be if land is taken inadvertently in a flood. Uh, that would be the only recourse that would be available. But we will work diligently with the village and with others to ensure that there are no issues. And I think that what we've shown tonight indicates how accurate our models actually are. Will residents be compensated for lower home appraisal values due to their location and proximity to the level? Uh, so right now we have no indication that home values would be impacted by the levy. Um, and there is nothing that we have in our authorization to be able to compensate people for any type of appraisal value that would be lost. Please explain why the levy could not be built at a lower height. So this levy needs to be built at a height that provides the greatest protection possible. Our standards that we build to require that we build a levy that includes freeboard. This is, a, this is an amount of height of the levy that is above the predicted level of flooding. We don't want to build to the exact level of flooding um, because there could be other situations that would occur that would cause the water then to flow over. So we provide what's called freeboard. It's, it's insurance against those uh, changes that would occur. Uh, and so the level that we have chosen is what provides the necessary freeboard to protect the homes in that area. Please explain why the levy uh, would need to be extended east beyond Hauser Junior High for Grove and area residents to be taken off the floodplain. A levy must tie into high ground in an elevation that is plus three feet above the 100 year flood elevation or the 1% chance of annual exceedance to meet FEMA requirements for certification. We currently do not think that we can achieve that requirement and are unsure of how far the tieback would have to go to get to that level. When we first looked at it, we ran into private property across the street and stopped because we would be going across the street and we're unsure how far we would have to go to get to the correct height. Crossing a street 
and the other factor of having to increase the rest of the height of the entire project added cost to the project and would possibly have made, knocked it out of consideration due to increased cost versus the benefits. There's also a process where a levy can be certified for a lower amount of freeboard. We are not sure that will work for this location at this time. It will be considered during our pre-construction engineering and design phase for further study. It is possible, it is possible that they could be taken out of the floodplain. Our current information indicates they will not be removed from the floodplain, but we will be going into the project with the hope of being able to do that calculation and see where that gets us. When was the last environmental impact statement performed? The Upper Des Plaines River and Tributary Study was completed with an environmental assessment. This ended with the finding of no significant impact on 7 January 2016. An EIS for this project was not required. Why does this project not address the Forest Avenue Bridge which acts like a dam at flood stage? We have never heard that Forest Avenue Bridge acts like a dam at flood stage. Uh, we don't have indications that it does. We could look at that again once we're into engineering and design. Since the BNSF trestle straightening would result in a one foot drop in the river level, can funding be put towards this improvement? Can BNSF be approached again, please? So our final report for the Displains Phase 2 uh, project did not include this as a project that was authorized by Congress. Uh, so um, therefore the study process that concluded that the benefits from that project were not as great as originally thought and did not remove people from the floodplain or prevent flooding, since it was not proposed or authorized, we are no longer under the authority to consider it for a project for the future. A new study would have to be started and cost shared with a non-federal partner to look at the possibility of that project moving forward. And that would uh, require funding as well. So we would have to have uh, action from Congress to authorize us to go back and look at this again. Uh, we would have to have somebody step up to be willing to cost share that study and then to move forward from there. Will you be incorporating the new Cook County Survey LIDAR data developed in March of 2018? This could be done during the pre-construction engineering and design phase, which would be the next phase that we would be getting into. Will you ensure the accuracy of LIDAR or any other data by performing a physical survey of the neighborhoods directly impacted by the Des Plaines River flooding? Our project engineering and design work will include surveys and verification of current conditions. That is a part of our process and we will make sure that that gets done. As the river is a flowing body, why doesn't the modeling show turbulence as river water is dammed against the park place tieback level, levee? The water would be expected to be essentially ineffective or not flowing up against this tieback levee. And part of the reasoning for that is the fact that this area is an area um, that floods as we've seen uh, in the video that we had last time. It actually starts flooding in from the south and then connects over and then eventually comes in from the north. Um, so we know that this area is not actually an active flowing area of the river. The river out in the main channel continues to be flowing. Uh, this is basically overflow. It doesn't actually have an active flow to it. Uh, and it actually um, shows that in the model. What other Army Corps of Engineer projects are happening upstream on the Des Plaines River that could adversely affect flooding downstream in our community? So the, the projects that were authorized as part of the Des Plaines Phase Two study include three levees and two reservoirs. Uh, those reservoirs are in the study to provide compensatory storage for the levees themselves. Uh, so there is no adverse impact from the other projects that are going in upstream uh, as part of the Des Plaines Phase Two. Please provide a slower time lapse video that clearly indicates the specific location, geographic elevation of the water on river water on Maplewood Road as correlates to the flood stage datum reading, as well as time lapsed in hours. We could possibly work on a slower time lapse video if it is going to be helpful. We will need further clarification of what is being sought as far as the elevation and flood stage. Uh, but again, this would be something that we would be undertaking under pre-construction engineering and design. What was the geographic elevation of the flood water modeled in the presentation? It is approximately 615.3 feet NAVD 88. Yes, 615 point, uh, 
what was the geographic elevation of the flood water modeled in the Army Corps of Engineers 415 presentation? Approximately 615.3 feet NAVD 88. Did modeling presented at the Village Board on 4-5 include the 2013 flood data? In what tangible way is the plan representing 4-5 different from the plan that the Village rejected in 2013? Uh, the modeling does include the 2013 flood data. We were able to get a model run that mimics the flood date uh, of 2013, and the presentation will show how pictures show pictures of how accurately the modeling depicts what happened on the ground in April 2013 flood. Uh, we didn't have a presentation, but we had the printouts. So, um, the plan for this work has not changed from 2013, except for the request from the village to consider a flood wall along Park Place rather than a road raise. It is our understanding that the village needed more time to consider the plan in 2013, and the Army Corps of Engineers has worked with the village extensively since 2015 to bring them the necessary knowledge to be more comfortable with the proposed plan. Please provide images of the modeling results that have better clarity. A scale key would be useful. Better resolution images without the trees in the way would be useful. Uh, I think that the information that we presented tonight with the 2013 flood should be a great help, especially given the aerial photos. We can work on further clarification for you should that still be necessary. Again, this is work that we would have to undertake under our pre-construction engineering and design. Is the Army Corps of Engineers using a one-dimensional modeling? What are the specific inputs that went into the computer modeling? This model is a one-dimensional, two-dimensional integrated model as was noted on our April 5th. Specific inputs can be provided should someone desire to look at them and were provided to the village engineer for their analysis. That would be Christopher Burke. Can we contain, obtain a copy of the Army Corps of Engineers report proposal reviewed by Burke Engineering? I believe there was a FOIA request uh, and that was responded to. Um, so yes, there was no report. It was just model data. We have photos and video that demonstrate the river water traveling over land to some houses on Maplewood Road. Will the modeling be reworked to take this information into account? As Jeff Zucker indicated at the April board meeting, we can look at additional data as being as brought forward during our project engineering and design. On April 3rd, 2018, after the first spring thunderstorms that hit the Chicago area, the Des Plaines River spiked more than four feet from its reading the day before. The most northerly station reading along the Des Plaines River was O'Hare, which recorded 2.3 inches of rain in 24 hours. Does the modeling take precipitation over time into account? What is the time lapse in hours? The model is based on a specific set of storms that takes into account precipitation over a period of time. More details I can provide to you should you want to take a look at them. But we want the community to understand that the Corps of Engineers the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, and FEMA have all agreed to use this as a regulatory model for the Des Plaines River. I believe that is all the questions from Maplewood. I think we'll have Mr. Daly with his presentation, then we'll take questions and comments from the audience and the trustees. Mr. Gailey. Hello. Um, as Jeff also mentioned, we do appreciate all the input that everyone is giving towards this. Um, we were tasked with reviewing the model that they um, provided to the village. And uh, this data that the Army Corps um, utilized for the event um, was accurate based on our review. Um, we reviewed the upstream and downstream gauge readings, as well as the methodology that they used. Um, and it, it did recreate the 2013 event quite well based on, yes. Can you introduce who you are? Orion Gailey from Christopher Burke Engineering. Um, we do conclude um, that the modeling was very representative of the event. Um, just for everyone's knowledge, and he just briefly um, touched on this, but the computer program that was used to model the hydraulics of the water flow through this area um, has been um, Calibrated by CBO, um, we worked on this model um, for the MWRD and calibrated that based on the 2008 event. Um, so we are confident that the modeling program itself does function accurately and that the input that um, the Army Corps used for the modeling of the 2013 event is accurate. Um, 
that's really all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has. For Mr. Zucker, Mr. Gailey, I, I do have I have one or for you, Orion. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to the questions that were raised about the possible impact on the sewer system, yes. Uh, can you speak to that, or have you had a chance to analyze that yet? As it results from the flood wall, it would have no impact one way or the other. Um, there are impacts, obviously, to the sewer system because of the um, lack of capacity itself, um, but the flood wall has no no bearing on on it one way or the other. Thank you. Any questions from you folks? And if you could please come up, like I asked, and, and have your question from the podium. No, sir, if you can, sir, we need you to come up here so people at home can hear and see you. I have a question on the map that's uh, in real time. The berm that exists, you can see that that is not compromised, right? Or is the, right? The existing berm on um, Groveland is not compromised? It floods around it. It floods around it, which means on the north side of Forest Avenue, where I live, along the river, that's where the water comes in. And then it goes back north and floods that area as well as to the north of that berm is a breach. Okay, if they fix that breach north, then the river will come down and still come in where we are. But does the berm have to be as high? I heard they're gonna increase the height of the existing berm. Well, it's not compromised here. So if you blocked up the north gape or gap, then the river would continue to go down and it would come in on our side of Forest Avenue. And the problem is it comes up and goes back north and floods them. So the proposal is to not only increase the current berm, but to build a wall from Forest Avenue south to the, the railroad, railroad bridge. bridge. Right. Correct. And I'm right in the middle there on the river. And I have only experienced that to come up just so far. Now, I wasn't here for this flood, but it seems to me if it, they tell me it was two feet at my front porch, and if you take a, a level line, how high does that berm really have to be on our side of forest? Because this is not compromised at all along here. Right. You want to add so, to this one and yes. then put a what, a 10 foot wall on our side? Uh, it, the, the level of the wall varies along that other side um, based on the ground level and where we actually end up putting the wall. Right, but it has to be at a level line all the way across. Correct. And so the reason that we would need to reinforce this berm, even though, you, as you say, it did not get covered by the 2013 mm -hmm. flood, uh, we have to build it to our Corps of Engineers standards so that it meets the standards so that we can certify the levy to yeah. meeting the safety requirements to protect the residents. Huh? What, what street is uh, I'm at West and uh, Pine. The greenhouse, right in the middle of everything. And I'm high on one side of my yard, and the other side dips down. You can see right here, this is that area that's low. And the water comes in here and goes back here, and also comes in on this side. So this berm is holding for this neighborhood, but it didn't work because it's compromised here and compromised here. Yeah, so we I, want to fix both of those issues. Yeah, but how high does it have to be? Because if you, you know, you could wall, Great Wall of China. We could, but we, that would be very expensive. And yeah, so, and also block out everybody's view and why, you know, people moved out here correct. to be on the river. And we, we, so the top of the wall elevation is going to be 618. This is currently, it's like 615 and a half approximately. So another foot and a half above that is what we're proposing. Okay, that's just a proposal at this point, though. Correct. Yeah, but uh, you know, if you take a level line straight across from where the, the height of the river, mm -hmm. and you want to add three feet over the highest flood? No, we can't add three feet. Uh, FEMA's requirements in order for their certification process, they state three feet. They do leave, uh, they do leave room for an analysis to say uh, that they would take something less in order to certify it, um, but we have not had the chance to do that analysis at this time. 
it would be part of our engineering and design phase that we would look at that and we would have final elevations for the entire location be able to tell you exactly what height the wall would be on your property okay. and how much of if it's on as the berm will be on our property um, so that's one of the things that we're working with the village on and that we've worked on in engineering and design it could be on people's property or it could be uh, on the I've been told there's a property uh, along the river that might be village property. We might work to try and put the wall there. And we will work with the village and the residents. I don't think so, because my property line goes like 10 feet from the river. Thank you, sir. Um, if you, when you step up, to you have your question, if you could please just give your name and your address, please, so we can kind of know where you are in the process. Hi. Uh, I'm Peter Schoenman at 235 Maplewood Road. Um, I have a question. Um, so, Jeff, okay, you you um, what is what is the base flood elevation for you? You mentioned freeboard and that it had to be three feet above freeboard. Is that correct? That's that's FEMA's certification requirement. Yes. Okay, so FEMA and the National Flood Insurance Program would would also that's, be they based it off of that. Yes. Okay. So the approximate. Flood, base flood elevation, the 100 year flood that they would base flood insurance requirements off of is the 615.3 that we talked about in the question. So, that Mabel would ask. 100 year flood, in other words, that's the 1% annual, annual chance. Annual exceedance flood. chance, correct. Well, I just, I just fact checked that um, because I have a smartphone. And at the FEMA site, it says, I don't have my reading glasses, but it says the base flood elevation. Um, the lowest floor has to be one foot or more above base flood elevation to be considered freeboard that would comply with the National Flood Insurance Program. So the my question is... Floor. That's referring to a home. I'm talking about what's required for the flood wall, um, right? I mean, you're talking about a home? No, they're, they're talking about the structure of a freeboard, which you mentioned had to be three feet. And on the FEMA website, it says it only has to be one foot. I can attest freeboard is definitely three feet for a flood wall. Uh, well, we could look, I, could, I don't know exactly what that's referring to it. I have to go back and look at the, the details of that and I can get back to you this about that. This is higher but. flood plain management standards. Um, and it said freeboard is a term used by FEMA's national flood insurance program to describe a factor of safety usually expressed one uh, in feet above the 1% annual chance flood level. And later it goes on to describe, so the structure built with freeboard would so this have is, its lowest floor, its lowest floor of the freeboard would be one feet, one foot. Yeah, so that, so what you're to referring to, so this, for that flood insurance, that's referring to a home. The lowest floor has to be one foot above the base flood elevation for a home. That's what they're referring to there. When we're talking about a flood wall, they require it to have three feet. Correct. That's what we build to. That's the standards that we utilize. They also give us the opportunity as the Corps of Engineers and other engineering entities to come back to do an analysis, a probability analysis of exceedance. Uh, a lot of these requirements are nationwide. And, you know, our nation is a nation of great diversity in terms of people and landscapes. Here in Illinois, we have very flat landscapes. So our water levels don't change much. In much hillier country, you want a little bit more freeboard because you want some assurance that there's not gonna be a greater flood coming down this massive hill. Right. So they allow for some variance and they allow us to do an analysis to show how often that could possibly be exceeded. And we go through that process in our engineering and design phase. Okay. So what you're re referencing is correct. That's the National Flood Insurance Program for homes. They want the base elevation to be at least a foot above. Right. And you usually use that for elevation of homes, uh, which is another program. They allow homes to be elevated. They don't right. want to leave them within a certain amount. They want to be able to sh show that there is freeboard above right. that base flood elevation. I, d I do believe it also applies to any countermeasures that homeowners would implement, such as their own flood wall. Uh, That's I've, probably true. Right. But, I, so, but we'd have to look into that. Okay. Um, the other thing that I, I wanted to address um, is this term 100 year flood. The, the term 100 year flood um, is kind of a misleading term because 
and you know we had to do dil due diligence to figure this out, but that means you have a 1% chance in any given year that a major flood event where the base flood elevation is 615.3 will happen. But um, that said, it also means, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, that every 30 years there's a 26% chance that this flood would happen. So um, I think a lot of people, a lot of homeowners think that, you know, a 100-year flood means, well, once every 100 years we'll get it. And no, not at all. It's um, the metric changes with different scales. So that's all I have. Hello, Lad Kohanek, resident of 99 Groveland. I'm the building which is just south of the two empty lots on Groveland. Uh, my parents bought this building in 1967. Uh, we always lived in Riverside. I'm very familiar with the property, the building. I cut, I'm the guy who cuts the grass, except for recently. And, uh, the first flood that we were in was in 1987. 87. We were married. Eight, that, right. So that was, uh, <laughs> and we're still together. Uh, the flood in 2008 was the time when they were working on the bridge, Forest Avenue Bridge, which they made coffer dams and blocked the free flow of the Des Plaines River and weren't able to remove that, their equipment and that partially blocked the free flow of the river. They got their equipment out. We were left to suffer. Uh, 2013, uh, another flood. Our lowest level in the building is level to the height of those empty lots. So when I measure how much water comes into the building, I mark it and I know where it is. These are all nipple floods. They come up to my nipple. I, it's never higher or lower. It's basically the same. Thinking about this over the years, Groveland is kind of like a bowl. And when the water reaches a certain level, now it's going to flood Groveland. Walking around, trying to gauge what's going to happen to us. Are we going to be flooded this time or not? What happens is that we start getting run river water through the fences along Park Place. That continues come flowing down I'm in the building and I'm seeing the river come down the street, rising and now entering my empty lots, and I know we're flooded. I'm out of there. We never, at that point, when we're initially flooding and that's water's coming in, we don't get the backfill of the river from Forest Avenue and the people who live on, on Pine? I West Avenue. Or West Avenue. When the flood is at the height, now West Avenue is flooded, Forest Avenue is flooded, uh, the street is flooded, Groveland is up to my chest again. I mark it on the patio doors. I have pictures from the first flood, dealing with insurance, dealing with the second flood and the coffer dam. I spoke to the town hall when Martin came and tried to explain 
what happened with their equipment and what they were doing and their response and what my opinion was to their response. They're measuring the level of the river on the south side of the bridge when it's hitting the north side of the bridge. And they're saying, well, our readings only show this much. Well, because it can't get through anymore. Surprisingly, and you can check the records at that, our discussion, which probably was a back and forth for 45 minutes, the entire meeting was recorded visually and auto, uh, with sound. That segment, when I spoke and there was this discussion, never was recorded. What uh, really just needs to be done, I haven't really followed the discussion of what need, uh, what's proposed and what needs to be done. I would think that if there's a levy built along the old existing trolley car right away uh, on Park Avenue that would lead short of the stoplight that would protect Groveland from flooding. How Maplewood might be able to deal with their situation, which I'm unfamiliar with, then they can discuss if they want to have a portion of the berm, berm going that way. The other weak point and you know, in 87, uh, people on west uh, didn't want to berm their living on the riverside of the street. In 2008, uh, there were maybe some interests, and the last I heard, everybody is so fed up with the situation that people are willing on that street to allow a berm to go from the Forest Avenue Bridge up into the train tracks. Once you hit that elevation of the train tracks, that's a natural berm. You're only asking maybe seven residents to have an easement to build a berm, which is basically comparable to what we have on Forest Avenue. I've walked when the river is high, when the river is low in these floods, and the top of our berm on Groveland is never compromised. It comes in from the north, it comes in from the south, it does not come over our berm. And the bridge does cause a lot of uh, problems. We're, we pass that bridge constantly and if there is a tree underneath that thing, Claudia is calling up the state of Illinois to have the bridge cleaned out from underneath because we're on top of so much. It disturbs our life, it disturbs our family life. Uh, our children have grown up on this. I love Groveland, I live, love Riverside. Things can be done, not major things, but with the influence of the people who live on West, uh, what could be, uh, and on, um, Park Avenue, that would definitely minimize the problem. Thank you for your time. Kaisa Johnson, 87, Groveland. My parents uh, built the four flat there in 1961. It was completed. Um, the driver here seems to be the certifying for the 100 year flood. Um, and after that certification, we don't even know if we won't be in a floodplain. Take that off the table. What, what does the model say if we leave the Groveland levee how it is, 
you build the other reinforcements, essentially, as I said before, close the screen doors. We've got the castle, the castle's fine, it's got screen doors. Fix the screen doors, leave the levee how it is, run your model, see at what point you have a problem. You know, run it with the 2013. See where the water ends up. How close is it to what you have here? How much of a difference does that actually make functionally? Um, especially because the land is so flat. Where, where is it going? Is it how it is now? What are the results? That I, I haven't seen here with the other structures in place, but not changing the levee height, not adding that what was two feet in April, and you're now saying it's a foot and a half, so, for okay. the flood wall. Okay, so your question is, if we build this, the current berm is 615.5, and you want to keep it at that level, that's what you're saying? Right. Okay. But take so. care of the ends, because that's where right, the right. flooding so comes on. So this modeling that we have done illustrates that, because what we have in the modeling is 618, but the water level does not go up past that. So 615.5, 618, whatever's in the model, doesn't matter. It will not have any impacts on the river level based on the modeling that we show here. If it has no impact on it, why would we mess with the levee? Why would we put that foot and a half or two feet of ugly metal there? And I, I want to qualify this as well. This kind of, I think, got maybe glossed over. You said we don't know how that levee is constructed, and if you're going to put the steel down, you have to know where you're going into, which to me sounds like you have to dismantle it. You talked about taking the trees out. Trees stabilize. If you create what you showed us in April that looks like a big bump in a, a, a golf course and has no trees to stabilize it, just turf, uh, I have issue with that. But um, it sounds to me that all of a sudden you're going to discover, now we have to take the levee apart, build it the way we know what it is, and put that in. And essentially we're going to get a whole new ugly thing that you just said isn't going to affect the level of the river. Um, so you're saying not affecting the level of the river is a good thing or no, a bad I'm, thing? No, I'm saying if if that difference doesn't affect the level of the river, why add that foot and a half? Okay. <laughs> sure. I think this question has been answered a couple of times. They have to do it. Their standards are they have to go three feet, have three feet of freeboard above that 100-year level. Is that correct? That's yeah. to get certification. My premise but they can't was pay for it if, if, if it's the done. certification. They would not be able to do the project if it was left at the level it's at. Well, so here's, here's the issue. So the reason that we would do anything to the levy, you're correct. We don't know how it was constructed. So to build it in order to meet the Corps of Engineers standards, to be able to put the stamp of the Corps of Engineers on it, we have to do something to it. So at a minimum, we would have to drive sheet pile through the middle of it, no matter what. By driving sheet pile through that levee, we establish the cutoff wall that we need to ensure that water won't come through the berm and will not penetrate that. Now, we already know that water doesn't come through the berm. Well, we know that it doesn't, not, the only reason we know it doesn't come through the berm at the higher levels is because water goes around it. So we have no proof that it's actually waterproof when it gets to that level. Does, do you, does that make sense? Because when you get to the 100 year, that levee is we, surrounded. You already said we exceeded the 100 year. Right. Well, when, you, when we get to the 100 year plus of 2013, that levee is surrounded. That means that there could be water going through that berm, but we have no way of knowing it. We, we can't prove it. We can't disprove it because it's surrounded by water. So in order to ensure that the next time the flood comes, we need to install a cutoff wall, which is sheet pile. You drive sheet pile straight down through it. It establishes the connection with clay that is a low permeable uh, type of soil that does not allow water to flow through it. 
Uh, I know nobody likes getting rid of trees. However, on an embankment, trees provide a preferential pathway for water. Trees always die at some point in time. Those roots are then left in place. What happens with those roots? The roots rot away. It leaves a hole in the levee. Water finds its quickest and most likely path. Uh, when you build an earthen levee like this, water on one side creates a path through that and goes down into the ground. What we do is we try and create the most impermeable amount of soil possible so that that water level does not surface on the other side of the levee. It's, it's part of the dynamics of how water interacts with soil. And so by driving sheet pile through it, we are gonna ensure that that water does not come through the levee uh, and we will build to a safety standard. Um, we can ask for permission to go lower than that, but then that requires the village and others to sign off on something that's not up to the standards. We cannot certify it ourselves. We would have to, it'd have to be at the request of the village or someone, uh, someone with authority to say that they're willing to accept the risk of not being built to our standards. We say that the risk is too great and we will build to our standards. If you want to accept the risk, if the village wants to accept the risk of building to a lower standard, we can work on that. I, I understand that you said that the objective is to get the greatest protection possible. I think that the objective should be to get the best reasonable, feasible solution and appropriate timeline. I disagree about trees. The tree roots don't automatically come out. You took the trees out of Swamp Pond, which were never a problem before. They hold these things in place. They transpire um, water out. Now we have problems because there aren't any trees. Trees hold ground together. They are not a risk. They hold things together. When something happens to that tree, the soil comes in, those floodwaters are gonna bring soil with it and it's gonna fill things in. It's not instantaneous, all of a sudden you've got Swiss cheese here and the thing's gonna come apart. It's, it's nature. I just have to say, you have to step back from the engineer, the structure, the fighting mother nature and look at how things actually work. Trees hold soil together. You know, they, they keep water, they take water out, they transpire it so it's not sitting there in the bottom of Swamp Pond, and then you put willow trees that don't work and become another problem. Of course, um, we have no, trees. We get huge trees that are blocked by... by that, that's a different issue. The, the damming you said you have no evidence of, the damming you said you have no evidence of is from trees that get stuck there and become a dam. Um, you know, I, I have plenty of, of other things, as you might imagine, but um, that's where I'll stop right now. Mary Erin J, 14 Avenue West, 14 West Avenue. So, all of a whole number of us. <laughs> along West and Groveland and, you know, all Lincoln and all kinds of streets, have been engaged in these issues to address flood mitigation for years, alongside the village, which has been wonderful, BNSF, MWRD, DNR, you name it. We've been part of these conversations for quite a long time. I appreciate tremendously that the village is forward-looking. That's important. I have to be forward-looking about my own interests and my own property. I, would, I have a couple of questions. Number one, if the village signs this deal with the Army Corps of Engineers, which the last time we met you said was going to take place sometime this month, is it a done deal that that levy will be built? Or is there a future stage in the process that could cause the levy to be abandoned? What we, the net, and, and Mr. Zucker can, can correct me if I make a mistake here. The next, the next step in this would be, and this was not, is not going to happen this month. The next step in this will be a, a, a PPA project agreement. Um, and, and that, what 
All that covers is design and engineering. You noticed tonight when Mr. Zucker was giving his comments, a number of times he said, we won't be able to address this until we're into the design and construction phase. One of the things that's kind of a chicken and egg here with these kind of projects is they run out of money so they don't have the money to go out and do additional due diligence and do, do additional research until that PPA is signed. Once the PPA is signed, they get another influx of money that allows them to do further research, the design and the engineering. By federal statute, by federal statute, we are required to have the right as a village to refuse the construction phase if we have, if we have doubts after the design and engineering is done. So there is, a, there is an absolute stopgap point at which we could say, after all of the questions have been done, after the design and the engineering, the personal, the manual surveys, if we want to walk away from this project, we can. And the residents have the opportunity to have an impact on that decision? Well, you have input it's on It's my property decision. you need. You can't do this project without my property. That's true. But we're your representatives. So yes, have, but it's my property. Have, my well, value is sunk well, we into have, that. Well, we have your best interest in, in, in heart, but we also have the You best have the best interest of, of the village at heart, village. and I understand that. I have to have the best interest of my property as my primary concern. As an I, individual, that's the only stance that I can take. So I, I, one of the other questions that I have really is more for you, Jeff. The statement that you made, and I was not the one who asked this question, about whether or not there would be adverse impact on property value by building that levy. I would like to know, based on what, did you, did you bring out independent assessors to appraise the impact on property values? My statement in regards to property values was a Maplewood Road question. Okay. And They're so not the they ones were, were the levy. <laughs> they were asking about their property specifically, uh, and so that was in response to that. Okay. Um, I, we would look at what the impacts of building the wall are. You would get compensated for the land needed. Um, I, I don't know if the process includes an appraisal of change in value based on that. It's hard to say. It has to. I, I we have could real look at that, but I don't data, know. Analytical real estate data from March 2018 that demonstrates that Riverfront property has a premium value above at 24%. If there is not an appraisal built into that process, it's not happening. We don't flood. All I can tell you is every one of us has our own interest that we have to protect. My property is my primary concern. So is ours. So I am saying to the village that there are certain things that have to be, have to be built into this process. The impact of value on my property has to be factored into this process. We will not agree to this. We'll have to do the survey. This goes beyond time. design is all I'm no, telling you. I understand it. Can we finish? Can, can, you've you've had a time. So, so the, the process goes through. We need to get these guys on board to give us a design so we can get surveys so we even know where it's going to go, if it's going to go anywhere. That's the first and foremost step. At that time, Ben and the board has agreed that we're going to have more time to discuss with each individual property owner what that impact might be for each property. That's only fair and reasonable to represent everybody. So, like we talked about last time, I look forward to the time when we can get a preliminary design in our hands, walk out with boots on, and look in your backyard with a survey that identifies as the wall behind your piece of property specifically, since you are nice and high, gonna be maybe a foot or two feet. How do we get access to the river? How do we keep views to the river? Those are all very important things that are very valuable to the village, right? And that's why we have, and we want to make sure that there's an opportunity to say, if this is the wall of China and it's really ugly, we're gonna say, no way, this is, this is a bad thing, right? But if we have an opportunity to help the folks that do get flooded, and we can do it in a manner that doesn't negatively impact in a huge way your piece of property, you're obviously gonna be impacted in some way. We are. I mean, at a minimum, if it doesn't impact the property value, it's gonna be a pain in the tail when the it construction's going the on, right? Value. So it will impact all of us at some point. Anybody that drives down Forest Avenue is gonna get impacted. But, but the whole thing is, is to take, 
get to the design, understand what's feasible within the money that they're offering to the village, and then move forward. At that point, somebody mentioned about keeping it at 615. If we continued it at 615, I doubt that they would fund it, so we would have to potentially fund uh, the north piece along Park Place to keep the water from North Maplewood for flowing into Groveland. That's a, definitely a feasible option. It's just we won't have the funds coming from another source to do things. So right now, I think the thing, the best interest, at least where my head's at, the best way to be a steward for the villages is to engage the design process very cautiously and then have the opportunity within the schedule. And Jeff has provided a really good schedule that has nobody's flushing it down our throat really fast and gives us that time to do the due diligence in a very proactive manner with each resident and each property owner. So that's my, my that's where my heart's at. And that's what I plan to do. So I just needed to express my own so yeah, that no, you know I, clearly I where we stand that, yeah. because it is our land, those of us mm -hmm. along West, that you will be yeah, I, taking I, and building. I'm, and building I'm a huge river lover. I said so, 14 West Avenue. So access to the river, no matter it's where we are. It's not just that. It's the view. Views. Oh, yeah. It's that's, the view. It's the, the property, the um, equipment on our property. Yeah. I mean, there are a number of things. Any one of you who is a homeowner, all of us, we yeah. all know what that means. Yeah. So we're just looking out for that, and we have yeah. to. So thank you. Thank you. Sir, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi, good evening. My voice never carries, so I hope all, like all you. of you can hear it. Uh, Lois Kimmelman, long-term resident of Groveland Avenue. Um, my husband and I have lived through uh, the 1987, 2008, and 2013 floods. Um, and this project, I believe, was uh, first proposed in 2013. I was against it then, and I'm still against it, and here's why. Um, we all know water has to go somewhere. I understand. I'm, I'm an environmental scientist. I've worked with many engineers. I understand about the modeling. But still in all, uh, I believe that this project would likely contribute to flooding in other areas downstream and elsewhere. It's now common knowledge that channelizing a river, which is basically what you're um, proposing, is actually one of the causes of flooding. Um, uh, I believe the Army Corps itself knows that. And uh, the Corps itself has adopted practices that deal with flooding in a more, um, I'll just call it organic way, such as substituting wetlands um, instead of walls and levees. And that's been done in, in, in several places. Um, as far as I can tell also, the environmental evaluation part of the project has fallen far short, and uh, Ben, I sent you basically the substance of these comments, uh, of what's required by law. Uh, there is a law called the National Environmental Policy Act, and I understand that there has been an EA environmental assessment done. Uh, but under NEPA, this act, uh, this law, potential project impacts need to be thoroughly addressed. Uh, several issues specific to this project, in my opinion, were not uh, adequately dealt with in the EA. And um, I know it was 2016 and there was a finding of no some significant impact. Uh, I wanted to ask, is that EA, was that done for the whole watershed or just for this particular project? Uh, the EA that was from January applied to the entire project, uh -huh. so it wasn't particularly specifically for this, but it did cover specifically this area as well. Wait, wait. So it was for the Groveland project that we're talking about here, or more? It over covers a, over each a, aspect of the overall this Plains Phase Two project. Right. It does an analysis of each piece of that project okay. that has been authorized by Congress. So there's a por portion of the EA that only deals with this? Correct. Okay. All right. Um, maybe I haven't seen that, but um, there are a lot of uh, issues that I don't think have been adequately addressed. Uh, one of them, uh, and again, I've actually been involved in a lot of EAs myself uh, in the past in my uh, work. But I didn't see, and again, maybe you can point to where this is, we all are going to suffer, whether we're for or against it, we're all going to suffer, um, I don't know, months, if not more, construction-related impacts, uh, pollution, dust, erosion, noise, vibration impacts. So what about that? That's just short term, which could be several months. Uh, destruction of vegetation, trees and other uh, vegetation adjacent to the flood wall 
I don't think those trees are going to come back. In fact, um, in the early 2000s, the berm was, was expanded, and there was an investigation and presentation of that as well. In the early 2000s, um, there were some concerns. In fact, there were some endangered species found uh, right there next to, in the forested area uh, west of the, of the berm. Um, I mean, you all may laugh, but I think that, that wildlife is also important, not only humans, and I'm one of the humans on that street. Uh, endangered bats were affected by the previous expansion of the berm, um, and many trees were removed. And that, that was actually dealt with in the, um, in the EA of that time. It's probably in the late 90s when that was done. Army Corps. Um, also, what about uh, aesthetic considerations? I heard the word ugly uh, a couple times. I don't know if it's going to be ugly, but I am having trouble picturing what this wall is going to look like. And I think the very least you can all do is to give us, um, the residents of Groveland, some sort of idea of what the wall may look like. You've done modeling for, for river levels and all that. What about modeling, or I don't know what you call it, visualization of what the wall may look like? I'm sorry? They showed some at the last meeting, some potential options. Yeah, I'm talking about what it will look like on our block, oh, not gotcha. what it looks like in Glenview or something. OK. Um, all right. So I don't want to go on and on. I think you understand I may not be supportive of the project. So just in sum, I question the huge expense, $7 million. I don't care where it's from. That's a lot. Uh, so I question the huge expense that's involved and also the effort of building and maintaining, um, not to mention, I think $7 million, by the way, is just uh, building this construction. And what about the cost and effort in maintaining? I, I had, haven't heard anything about maintaining of this. That may not be your purview, but someone's got to maintain it. Maybe that's the village. Um, to me, that seems like that's going to be costly in effort and expense. Um, so I question that and, and just want to reiterate that it has uh, many negative short and long-term repercussions. Uh, both to us, the affected residents, and to the environment. Thank you. Uh, just real quick, just for your information, the environmental assessment is available on our website, and I can get you that uh, link so you can go to it. You've got it? Okay. It's also on the website. Uh, and on the website, we provided the village some examples of what flood walls look like, some that we've actually built. And we will, that part of the project pre-construction engineering and design is to consider what we want that flood wall to ultimately look like, uh, the type of facing that it has on it. So the village will have some input into that as well. Oh, sir, sir, let's let we have somebody else who has it I spoken just, I, yet. I really have to follow up. I just quickly I went to the FEMA website and I just want to say that the minimum requirement for a flood wall or levy, according to their engineering standards for both FEMA and the National Flood Insurance Program, is one foot, not three. Thank you, sir. Hello, my name is Marianne Pirog, and I live at 89 Lincoln. In the uh, mid-70s, I bought an apartment building at 89 Lincoln. And I called up the village of Riverside, as well as my real estate lawyer, and asked about the river. Now, I'm not stupid. Rivers flood. They told me that there had not been a flood in Riverside for 100 years. So I bought the building. Uh, I experienced the flood in 1987. I moved into the building in 1981. I live on the ground floor. I only had about maybe four inches of water in my house, but I had to evacuate. I had to uh, replace all the carpeting some of my furniture. In 2008, it flooded again. It went from uh, my front yard to the back of my backyard. In 2013, it flooded again. 
and it went all the way to my parking lot. Kim Bark was not affected, but Groveland and Lincoln were. Now you talk about the view from the river on West Street. I really don't give a damn about the view from the river. Who would buy a house that floods? My cousin wanted to, cousin's daughter wanted to buy a house on Groveland. She asked about Groveland. And I said, honey, don't buy that house. It's going to flood. Because the water went up to the waist. One of my friends, Sue Bolt, lived in a, rented in a house. And she was carrying things on top of her head. And it was going up to her bust. Now you talk about a view from your house on the river. Wouldn't common sense tell you, don't buy that house, it's going to flood. I wouldn't have bought the apartment building. They said it wasn't in a floodplain. In 2008 they showed me, oh well, it's now a floodplain. I don't even get insurance on the building because I'm going to replace my carpeting. The cost of insurance cost me more than the replacing my carpeting. I took my living room, my hallways, my den, and I put marble floors on. So when you tell me, oh, I live on the river, I like the view, that's very nice, but it's going to flood. And you have to also respect other people's values. I can't sell my building for a million dollars anymore because it floods. I really want to sell the building. I'm too damn old to go through this again. I try to maintain the building. I try to satisfy my tenants. Everybody says I have a very nice building. I'm very proud of it. But I can't go through this much longer. A berm has to be built flood walls have to be made. They can be made attractive. They really can. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just get very upset when people talk about the view from the river or old oh, Maplewood. We don't want a wall on Maplewood. Don't buy property on a river. Hello, I'm uh, Michael Garman. I live at 175 Maplewood, um, which happens to be um, backs up against Park Place. So in conjunction with the first two gentlemen that spoke, I can pretty much corroborate their um, take on the events that we walked the neighborhoods e extensively after both the 2008 and 2013 floods. and. Um, Water does uh, enter Park Place from behind the, the homes on Maplewood, enters from Groveland area from the north, I mean from the south, uh, from West Avenue, uh, south of the bridge, and also um, up through the, uh, unless this has been corrected or changed, up through the sewer system on uh, Lincoln Avenue. I mean, I observed myself the water bubbling up through the sewer cover into the street. So there's basically three main entry points to water um, in the Groveland Basin as was characterized. And my only concern, I guess I would, I'm a little bit disappointed that this project seems fairly well developed and quite uh, for a long, with, and we've only recently become aware of it as residents. And so we do feel a little bit like we haven't had an opportunity to digest and reflect and offer um, concerns or points of interest or possible other alternatives at least to be considered and there may be reasons they've, they've already been considered possibly. But when I observed, I would like to say that when I observed the water coming north from the West Avenue area, I mean it was quite shallow so you're not talking about a foot of water or two feet of water. It may have been a few inches or something but all it takes is to get over forest and, and then it starts to fill the basin. 
And I don't know exactly what the measurement, how much, what the depth of the water that came behind Maplewood. It was fairly shallow, but all it takes is to get over the street. street. Yeah, so all it takes and then fills the basin. And my concern is, and there may be reasons, it's funding, it's regulations, it's protocol, but the project does seem to be fairly alarming. I mean, it's a pretty crude and unattractive solution, it appears to many people that live in the area. And uh, I agree that it's the Groveland Avenue berm never was breached that I saw. You came around and came under. That was the three entry points. In previous studies, and my question is, has you looked, have you looked hard at these alternatives? In previous studies, it was pointed out that if the, uh, and I know the Burlington Northern may not be the easiest to cooperate, I'm not sure, but if you're saying your models show that you could drop nearly maybe a foot of water by realigning the bridge, I mean, it possibly could be redesigned where you don't have any piers in the bridge and it's on the edge of the river. Maybe you gain a foot and a half or something and you don't have water coming back over west in the Groveland. And on the Maplewood side, I'm a, I'm a little startled. It would be take a simple measurement that if we have water coming across West Avenue at the bridge over to Groveland, that you wouldn't be totally clear that you would know that water is hitting the beam of the bridge coming from the north. We watch the water hit the bridge coming from the north. It backs up, comes around into Maplewood, back over into Groveland. So you don't fix the bridge you're never going to solve anything north of there. And, and if you don't consider the railroad bridge, it just seems to me the, the amount of money you're spending, you might be able to solve everyone's problems without this kind of crude solution by doing something with the railroad bridge and something with the Forest Avenue bridge. You don't have, and maybe that's something you could model in uh, your, if you remove or raise those structures, What's, what's the net effect? Um, it's just something for consideration. I know it's probably, it may cost more. It may not be part of the protocol of how the core ana analyzes things. But um, my last request would be is, at least to consider, is if the whole project goes forward as designed and you end up with a wall running along the um, homes behind Maplewood in the street, is at least put that wall up against the parking places and not back up because there's, I don't know how many, 20, 30 mature trees along there that my concern would be the kind of construction you're talking about, they're probably going to be all mowed down. And uh, so to, to set that wall far enough away where you don't have to mow down all the trees if possible, but and that's all that I have to say. Maya Schultz, 93 Lincoln Avenue. I really just have a comment for everyone. You can sit here in Riverside and take your little view and say we're gonna protect the environment and save the trees, but the communities around us are gonna do what's in their best interest, just like Mary echoed earlier, what's right for me? And those communities around us are gonna build their channels. They're gonna do the things that they need to do to protect their residents. So if we sit here and say and fight about environments and views, Everyone's going to go around us. And where were you when they were building those big developments with concrete out west, up north, that actually took our wetlands and made concrete go in there? And that's why we're having this flooding issue today. There's too much development going on elsewhere. And if you're not fighting that, then you're just fighting this battle. It's a losing battle. So I sit here with you, and I'm telling you right now, as a resident, looking at our village, looking at the tenants that are in our apartment buildings, they are here for Riverside for what it is. And what it is is a community where their kids can go to school, and when they flood and have to leave, those residents are telling everyone else, we're not gonna move there. Penny can't sell her building. I tried selling my house years ago. I had 45 people come through my house. They all loved my house, so like it's a great house. The flood insurance is going to kill me, and I don't wanna move into a house that floods. So, was it my fault for buying into a house that floods? Yes, but was I told differently that the house does not flood? Yes. So just so you guys know, everyone else is gonna do what's in their best interest, Communities around us will do the same thing, and they're gonna do things that will impact the waterway. And one day, you might find yourself in that flood zone just because somebody else did something because you weren't watching. So I'm gonna say right now, the environment, love it. I drive an electric car. 
I re recycle, my kids, you know, we do all our compost and all that, love the environment, want to save the environment, but you need to put the, the efforts elsewhere besides here and look at what the residents need for this community to go forward. Thank you. Um, Kathy Flaherty, 215 Maplewood. Um, I've lived there for 32 years. Um, I do not live on the river side of the street. My concern is when, they, when you talk about the modeling and how the, the water is going to come into the street, that is a problem for us. If it comes into the street, the only time we've ever gotten water in our basement, and I, we don't even have a sump pump. The only time we get water is when the sewers back up. If that river, which is now going to be blocked at Park Place, it's not going to have anywhere to go except backing up onto Maplewood, and it's going to come into the street, it's going to come into our basements, and that's going to be a problem. So I don't understand, and I, I feel for everybody who has flooding problems, because the couple times that it happened to us, it is devastating. I get that. But I don't think we need to change, I, you know, change something so that it's going to affect other people adversely. Why, you know, it's like the, the hillside strangler. They changed that and now it's, you know, it's become the Broadview strangler. So you can't do something that will help some people, which is wonderful to help, but then adversely affect other people, which is going to be the people on Maplewood. Um, also, and we're not in a floodplain, so, but, you know, that may change. One of the other things, because we've been there for 32 years, the 100-year flood has happened many times. Um, I, I know you said 87. It was 86, 87. There was a time in the 90s. There was another, you know, the 2008 and the 2013. 2008, I felt, was worse than the 2013 flood. And there was a comment. I, didn't, I was not able to come to the last meeting, but I watched it on uh, TV. And um, there was a comment that said that the water does not come over the land on Maplewood. I have pictures here showing water coming onto the land on Maplewood. Um, we sandbagged between houses so that the water from the river did not come into the street. So I don't understand where that information comes from. I, I think that there's so many missing parts here that people haven't talked about and, and haven't um, you know, taken into consideration. So I hope that we, you know, like I said, and just finding out about this whole thing, if you've known about this for since 2015, I don't understand why we just found out about it in April of 2018. That to me is, you know, unconscionable. That should have been something that everyone should have known about. We could have had input, but, you know, here we, here we are. Pardon me? All right, well. We're talking about the new levy on park. Okay, well, that's all I have to say. I think that, you know, we need to really um, think about how changing one thing will affect other people. I, you know, everything upstream is going to change. And, um, to, to our, you know, not to our benefit, to, it was, it's adverse to us. So, thank you. Mr. Zucker, could you address the, 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 no, could you address that concern that, your concern that the water is going to back up, up the street? Does your modeling suggest that? Uh, yes, yeah, so the modeling that we have run in, does not indicate that there would be street flooding. Uh, the modeling indicates that with the wall along Park Place that there would not be any adverse effects in Maplewood. That, that means that there's not an increase in water levels. If so, if in 2013 there was not water in a certain location, uh, once the wall is in place, again, that would be the case. It would not change what you saw in 2013. And if there are places along Maplewood that you're sandbagging that for some reason don't seem to be indicated in the modeling, we could take a look at that in our pre-construction engineering and design and see if there's anything that we can do to address that as well. But Jeff, wouldn't, wouldn't the water that they may perceive on the land side, land bridge, if you will, side, wouldn't that be from the water that is from the storm event and from our sewer and storm system flooding? 
uh, so it is possible. Um, uh, oftentimes, what can look like river water can be overland water flowing, uh, especially in 2013. Uh, that event was especially large event. Uh, we received somewhere between five and seven inches of rain in less than 18 hours. Uh, and so many of your storm sewers are designed for a 10-year event. This was definitely uh, greater in terms of uh, the rainfall and the time frame. Uh, so many storm sewers were overwhelmed and what could look like river water running through your yard could actually have been coming from other locations. I can't confirm that without specific pictures or information. But it is possible. Pictures, can, can we get a repository for those And pictures? we would definitely want to take a look at those. Yeah, but if, if, if folks have that kind of data, if you have photographic data, let's get it to us and we'll pass it on to the Army Corps and our engineers for review. So if you have it, let us have it yes. so we during, can make sure it's During the design reviewed. phase, it'll be great to take all those pictures and stick them up on the wall and then talk about the model pictures on each person's property and their the only way that any of us are going to be comfortable with this is if we feel that it matches what our own eyes saw. So that's really what the effort is, and I applaud Jeff for doing this with this, because this is the kind of stuff that really helps us all to digest it, right? When you have a picture that's taken, and if you took the picture and it matches what the model says, that gives us a standard of comfort, right? And that's really where we want to get to as we work through different options for this. Thank you. My name is Colleen Toriumi. I live at 211 Maplewood and I also don't live on the riverside. And um, as long as you brought up that modeling that matched the 2013 um, flood event, when you have photos of the flood event, it seems to me it would be really easy to produce a model that would match the flood event. See what I'm saying? You could, you could. But that's, that's what they showed. Right. You have the real photo of what happened in 2013. Well, can't you just produce a model that would reflect that photo? That's, that's what they showed you tonight. And then it was independently confirmed by our engineer with regard to their modeling. So we had an independent party review what Army Corps was modeled. And I did read that independent um, review and it said it was reasonable it didn't it it was just it just did not instill confidence that's all i'm going to say about that okay next is um you say that um mr zucher said that um the reason that there was sort of that lake maplewood in the photo before and after the levee that we couldn't really explain last meeting he said this time um, that it was because there was a flaw in the 1D and 2D modeling. There was some sort of glitch. So I'm curious, what guarantee can you provide that there are no other flaws in your 1D and 2D modeling with regard to Maplewood? Um, so I think... Uh what the information we received from the residents was that you did not see water in the location where our model indicated. Correct. So we went back and we looked at that and we agreed with you. There is not water in those locations. But we also took the time to look at what happened in 2013 and we produced the modeling of the 2013 flood along with the pictures. And the good news is that they match up very, very well. Uh, where we see water in the pictures, we see water in our model. Um, so we agreed with you. Um, these models are close approximations. They are not exact. Um, they are the best that we can do with the information that we have. And they are used throughout the United States uh, to do this type of work. And they are. this is what is accepted as the way to plan for this type of project. Um, I, we can talk all day long about uncertainty and we can give you all the data on it. You can look at it. Um, we, we're, we're happy to do that with you. Um, I don't know what else I can do to 
alleviate your concerns, but be happy to listen and try and do what we can. It seems to me like that Lake Maplewood is, is not just a minor detail, though, that was incorrect. That, that was a pretty significant flaw. Um, so the water level that we were indicating along Maplewood Road um, would have accounted for a couple of inches of water, a very insignificant amount of water compared to the actual flow that is going through the river itself. It did not impact the results. When he changed, uh, when he took that out of it actually fl um, getting in there, it did not change the results at all uh, in the rest of the model. Um, I mean, you're talking about a couple hundred gallons of water, which seems like a lot, but when you think about how much water is actually flowing through that river at that stage and that point of time, it's a drop in the bucket, like literally. So what recourse do we have if, the, if it turns out that the modeling is incorrect? What recourse do we have after the berm is built and uh, we find out that the modeling was not right? What recourse do we have on Maple Leaf? Um, so our pre-construction engineering design process is uh, instituted so that we can come together and look at all of these situations. And that is our process that we go through to ensure uh, with review by other entities such as Christopher Burke. Um, we also have experts uh, throughout the Corps of Engineers that will review this and look at it and make sure that these issues are not going to cause problems. Um, and as mentioned earlier, um, if there is a taking, which is a flooding of your land that we do not account for, you are able to bring a claim against the government. Um, otherwise, the government is protected under the National Flood Control Act of 1927. Um, but your representatives here have stated that they want to watch this closely and they want to monitor exactly what we do and we hope that through this process we can bring you to some assurances that our modeling is as accurate as we claim it to be. And. Um, is the reason that you're not using the latest LIDAR um, prior to the pre-construction and engineering and design phase due to money, the $50,000 that you were? Um, so the data that we had available is what was used. That's the 2008 LIDAR data. Um, I think some of the concern was that it's a level three versus a level one. Uh, level three being it could be plus or minus, well, I think it was six, to, six inches to two feet. Um, I think that's the level three standard. Um, so what that means is that when they flew the LIDAR, that's the standard that they had to meet in order to certify to that process. It does not mean that actually every point that was collected is plus or minus that amount. It's possible it could be plus or minus that amount. Um, but as we've seen from the modeling results versus the pictures of what actually occurred on the ground, uh, we seem to think that this is fairly accurate probably more along the lines of six inches or less. Um, just because LIDAR is classified as level three, that could be for the whole county. There could be areas uh, that were worse off and others that were better. Uh, it just depends on how, um, I mean, we have to get into the whole issue of how they classify it. Um, evidently, there is a level one. It isn't available to us right now. Um, we can utilize that in the future. Uh, and we would also do ground truthing with actual surveys where we'd actually have people on the ground surveying, uh, doing normal survey methods, uh, and checking that work as well. Um, so uh, we would want to use the new data when it's available. It is not currently available for us to use. Um, on the website, I saw um, the letter from David St. Pierre of the Water Reclamation District and I think it was June 18th of um, last year. And I'm just curious, when did you guys find out that this was going to be, um, when, that this was a viable project? I mean, when it, when it died in 2013 and we received the letter and it was in the landmark and we were all cheering on Maplewood that um, this project died, um, when was it re resurrected? When, when did you all find out? The Army Corps had approached the village. At that point in time, the village did not have any other partners. 
And so at, at that point in time in 2013, 2014, 2015, we discussed it with them, but noting that there was no funding for the village to pay for this type of project, it was pretty much dead on arrival. It wasn't until MWRD had a vested interest in this and said, we are willing to put forth the funding on it. And so as staff, our job is to secure funding for projects that could benefit the community as a whole. The board's job is then to vet those, discuss them, which is what, what's occurring now, and to make a decision whether or not to move forward with the project. So when did you all find out? With when, regard when, to when did you find out that the water reclamation district was going to... On the date of that letter. On the date of the letter. Correct. And not prior to that letter. Correct. And no one else knew. There was no one else that knew. No one else knew about... I'm sorry. Because there were whispers pre uh, previously about people knowing that this was there going There have on. always been discussions with Army Corps because it was one of their projects. It wasn't until we actually received a letter notifying the village that MWRD was willing to pick up the so local share. So that was share. June of last year. Correct. And then beyond that, there needed to be discussions within Army Corps of Engineers. We had a board liaison that had these conference calls and discussions of whether, at what point do we bring this to the board and to residents? Because we didn't want something that even though it's preliminary, something that was essentially half reviewed at this point. And there's a very lengthy process beyond this point in which we may decide, or the board rather, may decide that they don't want to move forward. Thank you. But ultimately, yeah. the biggest objective with regard to this is making sure the funding is secured. Because ultimately, beyond that, there, there can't be any discussion. Because we cannot afford to do this project right. on our own. Right. And I appreciate that last question. If I can just say something more generally, because I, in the last week or two, I've had people come up to me and say that, they, that they've heard from residents, oh, you know, we hear this is already a done deal. We, we hear that Ben's already decided on it. Or, you know, they, that they're keeping it from us. Or there's information that they have that, why in God's name would we do that? We're your neighbors. I have nothing but the best interest, your best interest in my heart. I would never keep anything from you. I would never lie to you about something like this. I have no authority unilaterally to make any kind of decisions about a project of this magnitude. And if I did, I wouldn't. This is a decision that's going to be made just the way this decision is being made. We're going to be talking with you. We're going to be talking among ourselves. Keep in mind that Christopher Burke Engineering is your engineer. They have no interest in carrying water for the Army Corps of Engineers, with all due respect. That's why we have them to safeguard this process. And we're going to do that every single step along the way. And when the pre-construction engineering design is done, if we have our doubts, if we think it's not something that's good for this village, it won't happen. But please, don't let the cynicism that permeates our culture poison this village. Uh, good evening. Uh, Nick Lambros, 276 Maplewood Road. Um, uh, Mr. Sells, I'm just going to pick up on what you just said, that you pointed out that Christopher Burke Engineering is our village engineering company, or the people that are looking out for us. Do we, do we have any other engineering company that has done studies for us? All I hear ever with any of the large projects is Christopher Burke Engineering, Christopher Burke Engineering, Christopher Burke Engineering. Have we explored other engineers? And we have chosen Christopher Burke Engineering. Why is it that we only choose Christopher Burke Engineering for this project and for others in the past? Because it's been our estimation that they're the best there is. Has it gone out to vote? Is that, and how is, it, how is it that you folks out. estimate that that is in the best interest of the village? There was a request for qualifications that was done 
several years ago when Peter Scalera was here. As part of that, there was a committee that was composed of, I believe Director Bailey was part of that committee, who was your Public Works Director. Mr. Ed Bailey? Correct. Mr. Ed Bailey, that I'm going to bring it up. Um, there was a forged signature on a document that Mr. Ed Bailey was involved with. Nobody seems to want to talk about that. And we're not, when it and came, we're not going to talk about that here tonight. We're not, I'm not going to. But allow you're you. bringing up Mr. Ed Bailey as a person of importance here. I think it's critical you, that people know we become suspect of the village and you, its dealings. If you have an allegation against one of our staff, you can bring it to me and to, and to Ms. Francis. Promise. Well, we become suspect in general. I think nobody wants to talk about it because we're just kind of like waiting for things to happen. And finally, just somebody has to speak up. I think that the village residents have generally become suspect of the way things are going and the direction that things are going in. And that's why people are concerned. That's why they're voicing their, that's why we have a large room of people here tonight. I think we have a large room of people here because they want to be informed of what's, what we're doing. I don't think we have a large room of people here because they're cynics. They're cynics of what we're doing. I'm not a Every cynic. Every time you I'm a up, realist. you are a cynic of what we're doing. I am not. Yes, you are. No, you, I you, am. You, you blame the village for uh, a permit that was years old. You blame the you blame the village because you can't. Well, put a I'm thing blaming the your village house. because uh, you know, I'm blaming the village because the village points out things that aren't true. Every time. We chose the engineers. The engineers do a good job. The engineers have brought to this village I suspect. A, a, a lot of money, a lot of grants, just like we, 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 we send out for bids for our lawyers. We, we have. I suspect there's something bigger going on with Christopher course, Burke Engineering. Is. That is there. absolute nonsense. There is. And there's, there's something bigger going on with us, too. Nonsense. And I find that personally offensive, to suggest that this board would do anything behind the scenes with Christopher Burke or any other consultant. Well, when, when we are happen. told, when residents on the Maplewood, in a particular section of Maplewood, are told that there is raw sewage and there has been a study done, a dye test study done, to determine that, in fact, raw sewage is being spilled into the river, and it comes out to be a false a false statement. We conducted our own professional dye test. We asked for results of the dye test. Nowhere are those results found. They were going to install this lift station on Maplewood at the 276, 280, and 274 uh, uh, home uh, shared driveway with, with a forged signature and nobody's approval. And they claim that they climbed on my roof with no approval from me and poured dye in my vent stack and said, my sewage, my raw sewage is going into the river. That's because I'm suspect. I didn't give them permission to climb on my roof. I never saw the study, the videos, the results, and yet they insisted the village insisted, officials of the village insisted that we were dumping raw sewage into the river. And yet, after all was said and done, and we conducted our own study from a private engineering company, it was found that, in fact, there was no raw sewage going into the river. That's why I am a cynic. That's why I question things, and I have the right to do it, and I have the right to share it, and if anybody else feels that way, they should speak up. This is the time to speak up. Thank you. Mr. Pollock, did you have something? I, I, had to, I was just going to suggest that we were wasting these people's time um, with issues that aren't on the table, and let's move on. Please. I'm uh, Monica Monteretto. I'm on Maplewood on the non-river side of the street. And I just want to clarify the um, statements of the water not going over the land or not being significant across the backyards going into Groveland through the Park Avenue area. My observations went into those backyards at peak. It was a heavy-duty current going through those backyards. I don't know if that's how you... If you're aware of that, 
um, was ripples. It was moving. So I don't, when I hear you talk, sometimes I think it's semantics. Are we on the same page or not? So I don't know if you are aware of these things, and I just want to make sure that you reach out to the people that live there and talk to them, because that's important information. That's all. Is there anyone who has something that hasn't been addressed? OK, if you could make it brief, please. <laughs> As you uh, know, I've lived on Groveland for a long time. In 1987, there was the flood, and uh, they wanted to reestablish the existing berm. And in order to do that, they had many studies. I'm sure the uh, Village of Riverside signed off on it. I'm sure Army Corps of Engineers signed off on it. There should be a paper trail exactly what was done. One of the subcontractors, Norm Sabluski, is the one who did the cement cap on the existing berm. He would have to, and I, he was also a friend, he would have to pour samples and leave them on site so that somebody could pick them up and make sure the quality of that cement is legitimate. He, that berm was deconstructed, there was clay added, uh, compaction, uh, everybody signed off on it, so there is definitely a record. You can't say that we don't know what is in there because that was, what, 30-some years ago? That's not a long time. That's saying that my college degree information they threw in the toilet by now. I'm sure if I called up U of I, they could bring it out in a heartbeat. So information does exist. You have to see how that berm has uh, been constructed and extend it and be done with it. Thank you, sir. Okay, we, we need to, we have a lot more I, on our agenda I, tonight. I understand. Uh, I just want to go with the berm. I think that with putting that metal in, you are cleaving that berm, and the driving of that metal is, I would think, uh, more likely to jeopardize the integrity of the berm than roots. Um, so, but I wanted to, I think he left already, um, something that I brought up in April that I'd like to reiterate, a uh, fellow who came up. You know, we're, we're looking at these structures, and residents brought up in April other things to look at. And every time someone would say something about the Trestle Bridge or Forest Avenue Bridge or the West Bank or the actual run of the river, which we know it's not really running naturally, um, has anyone looked at those incremental changes, how they would be synergistically? There's a lot of money. If you, if you take all of those together, what's the result? And the other thing that hasn't been brought up is we have not been pumping our wells for decades. And our water table, I'd imagine, is going up. If, if we start pumping our wells, which we have in place, haven't been using for decades, and we're clearing out the water and less likely to have issues where our sewer system is overloaded, you know, because if we keep pumping it, then instead of the sewer systems creating geysers when we have a flood, then some of that water can actually fill those voids because it's been maintained and pumped. And I would suggest looking at all of these things, how synergistically they could come together and create a difference um, and possibly not have to make as drastic man-made um, structures. Okay, so that's it. All right, we're going to move on now. Mr. Dixon, is that you? Um, yes. One, first I wanted to let everybody know that what Nick Lambros was saying was actually 100% accurate. Um, the lift station was supposed to go on my property at 280 Maplewood. But my question is, is this going to be, it sounds like you guys are going forward, that you're deciding that, it sounds like you're going forward, that you're deciding to go to the next stage and have the study go forward, have proposals made, things like that. Is that correct? The, the, the 
project partnership agreement will most likely be on the second meeting in July okay. for discussion. Okay, and after that, how likely is it that residents can then put an end to it so that it can't go, can't go to completion? I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, there will be constant input as the design and engineering stage goes on. The Army Corps will keep coming back and making rep reports as they go along, and every time they're here, we'll have this conversation. Okay, and if it does go forward to completion and it is going to be designed and built, will it be bid out for contract, or will it automatically go to Christopher Burke? Christopher Burke won't build it. The Army Corps builds it. Okay, it's just, okay. Thank you. Yeah, there's no, yeah, there's nothing in this for Christopher Burke. Can I, can I ask this one question yeah. to them? So a lot of the comments have been productive, some of them have been unproductive to me. Question for you two. I mean, it seems that communication is something that's causing some of the frustration. Is it possible for, for you guys to sit down with some of the folks during this process? And I, when you answer the questions for me, it's, 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 it's interesting to hear what an expert has to say, and I think that a lot of you guys have done a lot of great research. And asking to possibly sitting down in, in a more private setting might be mutually beneficial for everyone. Um, I don't think that that should be done with, with, with a negative connotation to it, so I think that if people feel like they do need more communication and, and we'll, you guys are able to do that, that might be something that would help people understand what's gonna happen, how it might or may, might not impact them. Because the most discouraging thing about tonight is You've got all these different groups of people with these different opinions. And I think it's really difficult for anyone here to walk out of this room feeling comfortable with what's going to happen because we all have different different thoughts on it. So I'm just wondering if communication is, is the foundation of this. Hearing your responses to me is very helpful. Um, reading it on a piece of paper for me is very difficult. Uh, Ms. Toriumi, you know, you mentioned the communication thing. Sitting down with them, talking to them, learning more about it I think might be helpful. Uh, some of you other people that have spoken, I think that um, it might help. So just, that's my thought on this. And if it's an option, maybe something that we could throw out to folks, shoot me an email and I can try and coordinate it for you. It, I'm happy to help. It's the, the, the time to present where they're at at the phases of design, it is in there and then it is time to sit down. And again, we need to get the table down on the floor and this needs to be a round table rather than a a cratic type situation. So. But, but, I, but I would, I just would, I would want to add though that Ms. Turimi sent a letter to me with, the, with many of the questions that mm -hmm. ended up being in the petition. And within a day, Mr. Zucker yeah. responded to her directly, mm -hmm. answering all of her questions. Now, I don't know if that, if that letter made its way out to other folks, but I mean, my, it, you know, um, he responded instantly. Yeah, so have, I think that's a great we idea. We have to have that communication yeah. level. I agree with you. Yeah, it's, but, I think but, it'll help. I really do. And, if, and look, you may not agree with what happens, but at least you, you guys are communicated with it in a way that makes you guys feel comfortable, and these guys are willing to do it. It's something that we could consider. As but, part of our process, we could consider right. having forums where we yeah. would address issues. We just keep it positive, right? And I think that this is a great forum for what we're doing but maybe something a little bit more tightly wound. I mean, I've done that. I've only been doing this for a year and a half, but I had a session at the library with a bunch of parents, and it was one of the best experiences I've had the past couple of years. So maybe all, if some of you guys can come together with them and talk and share ideas. I mean, that's, that's what this is all about. Okay, so I'm gonna bring this item to a close. Thank you all for coming tonight who came for this issue. Um, Give you some time to move before we go on. Okay, if you're, if you're done here, if I could ask you to step out so we can continue with our meeting.
If I could ask you if you're done to please step out so we can continue our meeting. We have a lot more work to do tonight. Next up this evening is public comment. Mr. Gallegos. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mr. President, trustees, those in attendance, and to those watching at home. Sorry, coming for you and the Village Board on behalf of the Alliance Club. And I have two items of which to speak of tonight. Uh, the first item is the second annual first legal Scuff Gross Memorial <laughs> Riverside Regatta. Uh, this will happen on Sunday, June 24th, and paddlers are asked to meet at McCormick Woods at 10 a.m. Uh, from there, we will paddle south uh, along the river um, and around the First Division and then under the Swinging Bridge and get out at 43rd and Oak. Uh, this will probably take about an hour's time to be on, on the river total time. Uh, spectators are encouraged to watch at the Forest Avenue Bridge, the um, Yeah, the Joliet Avenue Bridge and also the Swinging Bridge, or near the Swinging Bridge, let's not overcrowd it. Um, as we color the river with kayaks, it will certainly take for uh, terrific pho photography. Um, Scuffy's family will be there. Uh, two of his daughters will be kayaking, and his uh, widow will, of course, be observing from the Swinging Bridge. Uh, thereafter, everyone is invited to join in the refueling and rehydration at La Barra. <laughs> it should certainly make for a terrific event. Uh, as you know, Scuff was a uh, township assessor for 40 years. He was a lion for 65 years, and he was also person of the year 1988, which brings me to the next topic. And it is my pleasure to announce this year's recipient of person of the year. With its near 70 year history, it is the most prestigious award in Riverside. And it is a uh, uh, this year going to Frank Gangwer, who has served our village in many different capacities, uh, parks and recreation, uh, church, Boy Scout, um, and as with tradition, uh, Riverside Day will be uh, announced at the end of summer, where we'll have a, a dinner celebration for him at the Riverside Golf Course, and I will have more information on that uh, at a different meeting. That's all I have for tonight. Thank you so much. Yes. Frank's an excellent choice, by the way. Um, just so people, what is the McCormick Woods? Just if they don't know the name of it, can oh, you Oh, it is at 31st and 1st Avenue, the northeast section. Thank you. Uh, and just so people know, I will be kayaking myself on Saturday just to make sure that the water levels uh, are of a safe nature, that we're not having um, you know, any other <laughs> obstacles in our way. And uh, if they could look on Facebook, um, that's where I'll keep open communication with, with those interested in, in this event, which is free, by the way. Okay. All right. Thank you. Excellent selection. Congratulations uh, to Frank. Awesome. Mr. Dixon. Hi, uh, Robert Dixon, 478 Uvedale Road. Um, I am a member of the Homestead Society Board. And I wanted to uh, ask for your consideration on the special application for Hop Stop 2018, which is a craft beer festival. It's, we're partnering with the Riverside Arts Center this year, and we are hosting it on Quincy Street. So it's a little different location. Uh, it's August 25th from 5 to 8 p.m. I think it'll be uh, a great location. We're partnering with the RAC. They're, off, they're having an auction that'll take place in their gallery space and their open space with, with somewhere between 60 and 70 artists who've contributed to the Riverside Arts Center over the many years. Um, there's a special poster. It's actually adapted from an oil painting by Jennifer Taylor, who was one of the original uh, founders of the RAC that advertises the event. I'll share it with Kathy and she can present it to the trustees. Uh, hope many people can come out for it. We'll have over 15 brewers, um, some pretty rare specialties from Chicago and micro local brewers. Uh, some of the music is going to be presented by a band called Trench Drain, which is fronted by the uh, brewer and owner of Flapjack Brewery in Berwyn. Uh, the Mountaineers, who are a tight vocal group, bluegrass harmonies out of Berwyn. And then it'll close with the Sundown Club, which is a, a band from Chicago. Um, is there anything I'm missing?
thanks again. Thanks for the support. And come on out. Buy some tickets. Anyone else? Okay, we'll move on now to the Village President's report. <clears throat> I have a number of appointments uh, this evening. As you know, most of the commission terms expire on June 1st. So I'd like to have a motion and a second to approve the following. To the Board of Fire and Police Commissioners, William Smith is chair. Reappoint Patrick Lang and Matthew Connolly. To the Economic Development Commission, Christine Herbst is chair. To the Landscape Advisory Commission, Kathy Maloney is chair and reappoint Yvonne Lucero. To Parks and Recreation Board, Elizabeth Koss is chair. To the Planning and Zoning Commission, Jill Mateo is chair. To the Preservation Commission, Charlie Pipel is chair and reappoints the following, Tricia Baum, Aberdeen Marsh Osga, Richard Ray, and Thomas Walsh. To the Riverside Historical Commission, reappoint Constant Guardi as chair. And to the Riverside TV Commission, reappoint Greg Gorski as chair and reappoint Eric Sundstrom and Steve Wojcik. Ask for a motion and a second. By Mr. Lumsden. Second. By Mr. Ballerine. Any comment? Please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Giza. Aye. Trustee Lumsden. Aye. Trustee Ballerine. Aye. Trustee Sedby. Aye. Motion carries. The only other thing I have this evening is just a, a brief notice, and I'm going to do my best to try to get the girls to come to uh, an upcoming meeting. But if you have a chance in the next week or two, I want you to go out to the scout cabin. The Girl Scout Troop, troop 41020 has completed their Silver Project Award, um, and it's they were able to add cut log benches around the existing fire pit, an eight-person picnic table, a garbage enclosure, and landscaping around the perimeter of the cabin. It's a major uh, benefit to our village, and the girls did a great job. And uh, we'll do our best to get them to come to the village board meeting in the next month or so, so we can say thank you personally. But if you have a chance, go out and take a look at the scout cabin. Uh, and that's all I have, Manager Francis. I do not have a report this evening. Next up is the approval of the consent agenda. On the agenda this evening is to approve the voucher list of bills for June 7, 2018, the Village Board of Trustee regular meeting minutes of May 17, 2018, file and review the following, Economic Development Commission meetings March 8, Planning and Zoning Commission meeting minutes April 25th, Historical Commission meeting minutes April 16th. File and re review the contractor report and file and review the finance department monthly report of April 2018. A motion to approve the special event application for the Independence Day festivities in Riverside on July 3rd and 4th. And also a motion to approve the special event application for Hop Stop 2018 to be held on Quincy Street on Saturday, August 25th. And lastly, a resolution approving an inter intergovernmental agreement between the Village of Riverside and the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District for construction of a permeable pavement, parking lot, and bioretention facility. I would ask for a motion and a second to approve. By Mr. Gisa. Second. Second by Mr. Sedevi. Please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Gisa. Aye. Trustee Lumsden. Aye. Trustee <coughs> Ballerine. Aye. Trustee Sedevi. Aye. Motion carries. Are there any reports of departments, commissions, or trustee liaisons? Moving on to ordinances and resolutions. First up, an ordinance amending the official zoning map of the Village of Riverside to rezone the properties located at 7234 Ogden Avenue from B1C, Commercial Subdistrict, to B1TC, transition, Transitional Commercial Subdistrict. Director Apt. Um, yes, the Planning and Zoning Commission reviewed this application and held a public hearing on May 23rd. The application, as you stated, is for a map amendment. Uh, this is regarding the property at 7234 Ogden Avenue, which is currently zoned B1C Commercial Subdistrict. Petitioner is requesting to change the zoning on the property in order to allow the existing building on the property to be converted from medical offices to residential condominiums. Uh, residential dwelling units are only permitted above the ground floor in the B1C district. Therefore, some sort of zoning change or relief would need it, be needed in order for him to do that. He seeks to change the zoning from B1C to our B1TC, or transitional commercial subdistrict, which does allow multifamily as a permitted use. The property currently has uh, about 39 parking spaces. The zoning code requires two parking spaces for each dwelling unit, so his existing parking lot would be able to accommodate the required parking for this conversion of use. Um, he is proposing 12 units uh, in 
this building. Uh, additionally, our code does require landscape buffers and screening of the parking lot between B1 zone properties and residentially zoned properties, and this property is uh, boarded by residential properties to the west as well as to the north. So um, the property currently does not provide that required buffering, and any change in the zoning would require him to bring that into conformance as part of that redevelopment. Um, Let's see. Staff has stated in our staff report that um, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning um, says that the vacancy rate for offices in the Chicago metropolitan area has exceeded the national average and that of our peer metropolitan statistical areas since 2006. Um, by the end of 2017, the office vacancy um, rate here had only declined slightly to 13%. So this is not really identified as a a really thriving office market um, currently. Staff noted um, at the hearing as well that I did reach out to some local realtors about Riverside's condominium market, um, and the realtors say that demand for condos is much lower than the demand for single family in Riverside, but there is demand for condominiums, especially condominiums with parking. Um, and they also noted that the demand, the stronger demand is for something that's more affordable, i.e. not luxury. I'm not saying like affordable submarket rate, you know, I'm not trying to make that assumption that that's what he's doing, but I'm just saying that the demand is not high for the luxury condominiums, it's more for kind of your average price range condominium. Um, we also looked into the historical zoning for this property. Uh, this property was zone B1 residence, which was called two-family dwellings, uh, in 1972. By 1980, the zoning had changed to B4 office residence, uh, which then changed to R4 office residence in 1989. And then finally, in 2009, the village rezoned the property to B1C business commercial. If this zoning is approved, there rezoning is approved and he moves forward with the conversion. Uh, there will need to be a site plan review. He will need to go through the condominium conversion approval process and obviously building permits would be needed. Um, I did provide you with um, kind of the background of the B1 district um, and how the B1 two sub-districts came to be in um, the agenda history sheet. So you have that as a background, but it basically says that um, there's different intensities of uses and physical characteristics and functions of our B1 districts. Um, and so they identified two sub-districts each with its own set of allowable uses and bulk regulations. Where the B1C sub-district is intended to create a commercial environment for a variety of retail goods and establishments, um, personal service establishments, etc., cetera, um, that are oriented more towards vehicular access. Um, the B1TC is intended as more of a transitional area, as its name states, um, where low intensity retail good establishments, personal service establishments, and office uses, as well as multifamily and townhomes, can transition to the surrounding single family areas and neighborhoods. So um, I did provide you with kind of an excerpt of what the permitted uses are in the B1C and the B1TC districts, so you have that for, for reference. You know, specifically it calls out the difference in what residential uses are allowed, as well as some of the um, commercial uses that we kind of just talked about. At the public hearing, Dr. Sheik, the owner who is here this evening, um, said that he purchased this property back in 1983 and opened um, his psychiatric office at that location. In the 90s, there was a major addition that he did to the building, and over the past several years, he says that unfortunately his vacancy rate has risen and he's been unable to lease um, the, the available space or just sell the building outright, indicating that he had actually tried to put the building at auction and had had no bidders on it. Um, he also stated that for 30 years, the building was 100% occupied, but due to the lack of demand for medical offices, he currently has been unable to lease the vacant space, and it is only currently 17% leased with just one tenant. Um, he is proposing to convert the building into residential condominiums and believes that there would be demand for these handicap accessible condominiums with parking. He said Riverside is a high quality residential community that people want to live in. Um, the commission had a lot of questions for the petitioner, including how he came to 12 units, if there's going to be any additional green space, um, if there was going to be any addition to the building or like physical changes onto the building in order to do this conversion. Um, they also asked about what 
kind of level of effort if they'd really exhausted all the opportunities to sell or rent or lease this property. Um, the petitioner stated that he has used realtors, made brochures, reached out to various medical practices, et cetera, with no success. Um, he said there's not going to be any physical additions to the property. He's not going to be adding balconies or decks or anything onto it um, for part of the conversion. So there's not really going to be any physical footprint difference to, to the building itself other than bringing it into conformance in order to provide the necessary buffers uh, for the parking lot and screening between it and the residential um, districts to the north and to the west. Um, Let's see, the commission also asked if he'd consider only converting the upper floors uh, so that the zoning wouldn't have to be changed. And he uh, stated at the meeting that he did not believe that mixed use was really appropriate in this location and would not be as marketable. He noted it was different if you were in a downtown, but on Ogden Avenue at this location, he didn't believe that a mixed use would really positively market the, the property. Um, there was several members in the audience that had questions. A lot of their concerns revolved around, again, whether there would be any sort of like physical changes uh, to the building itself, expansion, anything coming closer to them. They had concerns about whether there was adequate parking um, for it to convert to residential, um, but they also had concerns about rentals and whether rentals would be permitted or not. Uh, at the time, the petitioner said that he would be open to restricting rentals as much as possible, um, but he didn't necessarily want to eliminate that possibility altogether if there was, you know, instances of a financial hardship or something for individual uh, condo owners. Um, let's see. There was also some discussion about the taxes on the property. Uh, the petitioner relayed that his taxes were approximately $156,000 for the property. However, since it's been vacant, his taxes have been resumed as a result of appealing his property taxes. So he's currently stated that he's only paying approximately $42,000 annually in property taxes. There was a lot of discussion by the commission kind of weighing the two sides. Um, they noted that with the scenario of the property, if he only converted the upper stories, the property would not have to be brought into conformance in regards to the screening and the parking lot. Um, however, they also expressed concern that no local realtors had been, really been consulted about the marketability of residential condominiums in the, in the area, and they were also weighing it against um, the fact that this was one of the only few viable commercial properties on an arterial, and that by allowing the rezoning, there would be that decreased opportunity. Um, but they also weighed this against what happens if this property just continues to sit as a vacant office building and, and no benefits then are found to the adjacent neighbors. Ultimately, the Planning and Zoning Commission made a motion and recommended approval of the zoning change. Um, the vote of 6-0, so it was a unanimous vote. And uh, they did make that recommendation with conditions that were recommended by staff. Uh, and you have those outlined in your report, and that includes bringing the parking lot into conformance with regards to the buffer landscaping. So you have a motion, you have an ordinance before you to consider. The petitioner is also here to answer any questions, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. So before we have our conversation, I have a motion to approve an ordinance amending the official zoning map of the village of Riverside to rezone the properties located at 7234. Uh, we have to have a motion first. Um, 7234 Ogden Avenue from B1C to B1TC. By Mr. Lumsden, second. second by Mr. Ballery. Questions for Director Apt? The petitioner is also here. Do you have questions for him? So the uh, 10 foot buffer that they spoke about at the Planning and Zoning Commission, does that have to run all the way down the property from the front to the back? Um, <coughs> probably should be running all the way along that western property line because there is parking in front of the building so that could technically be considered part of the parking lot um, and then all the way to that back property line and what does that do to his, to his what does that do to the parking issue if he loses his, I, I would assume there's already five there when i when i drove by there and yeah that sounds about right about five parking so they're gonna take, you're gonna take another five you're gonna have to move the driveway or entrance over he should still be able to accommodate the required 24 parking spaces if he loses the one right in the 24? front 24 how many spaces did you say? 30? He has 39. There are 39. And how many does he need? 24. Anything else for Director Apt at this point? Thank you. I'll oh, just follow to, so, to bring it into conformance, it's a 10-foot buffer along the west and north property lines. Because there's parking, yeah. Um, 
So 10 foot along the west property line is going to eliminate, looks like, six or seven parking spaces, right? Mm -hmm. All those parking lines. All the ones, between yeah. Between the building and Right the along, line. exactly. And then um, 10 foot at the rear is probably going to eliminate three additional parking spaces. So, okay, we're just, just trying to play that out, see what that means. It's getting close. If it's something that he can't accommodate um, as part of that, he would then have to include a variance request as, as part of his site plan review. So, Mr. Cariello? <clears throat> Nick Cariello? 354 Lino Road, Riverside. I'm going to repeat what I said at the Planning Commission. If I can get my scratch sheet up. I started with a personal note that a Cariello has lived on Lionel Road for 78 years, and that I was seven years old when my parents moved to Lionel Road. The 7234 Ogden Medical Building and Property this the seven the 7234 Ogden property, along with the McNeil building, over the years, has lowered the value of the 24 residential properties on the east side of Lionel Road, the east side of Delaplane, and the south side of Blackhawk. My backyard extends to the 72 34 property, along with several other properties on Lionel on Blackhawk. The proposed condos would be a hard sell as a 7234 building has no common ground, surrounded by two parking lots with a combined total of over 200 parking spaces, a condemned two flat building and Ogden Avenue. The property also went to auction without a buyer. The building also has a financial problem, a $700,000 plus mortgage, which will increase the cost of each of the 12 condos by $60,000. Rezoning will not solve the problem or satisfy this mortgage and could lead to a financial crisis. If I remember, the B1T zoning only allows for no more than a five-foot setback if the 7234 building is set back more than five feet from the lot line, it is a non-conforming building. And I believe the setback is 15 feet. If so, I can't, can't understand anybody buying a condo in a non-conforming building. Thank you. Trustees, comments, discussion, questions? Uh, I guess I'll um, kick it off. I, I, I'm struggling with um, this. I, 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 and I, I feel bad that I wasn't at this meeting because there was a, a train of thought that was not pursued at the Planning and Zoning Commission. I think Dr. Sheik has been a good steward of the property. I think his presentation was wonderful and heartfelt. 
where I'm struggling is I don't think conversion to condo, 12 condos is in the highest and best use for that property. I think it prohibits really what is one of the premier locations, sites for commercial redevelopment in our village. I think um, Riverside for a village that's world renowned for its planning failed miserably on its major thoroughfares. Um, what we've done with um, residential on Harlem and Ogden has really landlocked us and put us in a situation where we're over-reliant on real estate taxes. Um, so based on that, and really based solely on that, uh, I cannot support um, rezoning the property and allowing for a use that's not in the best interest of the village. I think I would also point out that the property taxes currently being paid as reduced, roughly, in my opinion, approximate what a successful redevelopment as condominiums would be there for 12 condominium units. I think that further reiterates to me that that's not the best use of that property. And, and, and I just apologize that that train of thought was not pursued and uh, you weren't given an opportunity to address that at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Anyone else? Would you like to address that, Dr. Sheik? You know, besides owning the building, <clears throat> I have been part of Riverside for 37 and a half years. <clears throat> I started in 78 at McNeil Hospital and driving through back and forth to Riverside for many years, living in Hinsdale, now in Oak Brook. And I have had a side business as real estate. I got divorced about 11 years ago, so this building ended up with me. This is totally beyond me where the building used to be 100% occupied. We have gone down to now 17% occupancy. And Part of the reason is, being a physician, I used to run a group of 17 of us, that there is no demand, particularly for medical offices. The hospitals which are successful, they are building their, their own brand buildings, move their own doctors. I have joined Advocate after 30 some years of practice because that's what's going on. I have tried everything which Sonia mentioned, even renting, trying to rent this place at $7 a square foot, when I used to get 16 triple net at one time. This building has been losing money for the last almost about three and a half, four years since American Cancer Society left the two floors. I have had no luck trying to auction the building. Now, why would I choose this route to go is simply, I have no idea what the answer will be if we don't do anything. I have enough financial buffer. I have about 600,000 plus mortgage on the building. And my estimate is even if we ended up spending about 60,000 per unit in development, that comes to about close to 1.2, 1.3 million. And the studies, we have looked at the uh, Riverside area that most of these places are selling the, we saw a couple of very bad ones, condos, for about $160,000 $160, for about maybe 1,000 square feet. Will I be happy to walk away if this building is fully occupied and if I made some money right now, I am losing literally 110 dollars to $120,000 a year for the mortgage and the property tax and the common area maintenance. Respecting the Riverside, if you go there now, it's a very pretty building. You want to see trash all over, even, in, even though it's empty because I'm continuing to pay the bills and do those things. I can understand the interest you are talking about, some commercial development, something like that in the area, I think all of us know that the office market is not going to come back, whether it's medical, 
whether it's uh, for other uses, because wherever you go, there are higher, higher uh, vacancy than it used to be because mm -hmm. of the new technology and the new ways of doing it. I afforded this opportunity and asked the zoning to be changed that I have a lot of buffer. Let's say I end up selling it at the cost. I don't lose any more money. If I end up making even small amount of money, and fortunately being a physician, I still work full time. So I do not need to depend on this building except that I would like to see the point which was made earlier that I do not have any answers. I'm not kidding you. We were looking for $600,000 as the, uh, what do you call that, uh, limit, you know, that if somebody bids at that. I had not, no takers at all. I would have walked away paying fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 from my pocket as a loss and forget about it. So I really don't know what the answer will be, but residential market is there, residential, whether I will end up selling all of them or part of it, or as I mentioned, that we may have opportunity to maybe also have the, in the bylaws of condominium that some could be rented. I'm going to be part of this town because one of the condos is going to be my daughter living in, you know, because she needs a place and that'll be nice of me to do that for my own child, that she would own a nice place in a beautiful town of Riverside. Um, I really appreciate all the questions they have that day. I'm not an attorney. I'm just an, kind of an average guy and a physician. So I would love the opportunity to be given to me. I'm very proud of Riverside and being part of it. And somebody brought it up about the parking lots and all that, and you need the buffers. I can guarantee you we'll go beyond that. Landscaping the building, if it needs more trees, more bushes, better it will be. It'll be marketed a lot better. Thank you. So I, I have a couple questions for you, Doctor. The because I, I watched the, the plan and zoning meeting, and I understand you, you, put, you put it up for auction at one point. Have you always been, though, trying to market the building for office and services and medical services? Was the auction specifically for that use? Have, have you made any attempt to consider other kinds of commercial development with regard to the property? No, I mostly just looked at the offices. It's built as an office building, not necessarily the medical offices. As I said, we have had American Cancer Society. They had two of the half floors, and they were not the medical practice. So I have had no luck. No. Any other questions for the doctor? When's the last time you marketed the, uh, the, the uh, units for uh, rent as offices? Um, you know, I applied for the uh, tax appeal because of vacancy. It has to be about four, four or five years ago, something like that, that we not only put a sign outside, I, I don't know if I have made a beautiful multicolor brochure, knowing that the doctors do not really look at the emails because unless you know who's sending it to you, so me and my wife personally put the brochures in every single mailbox at McNeil, which is the closest, and LaGrange Hospital and Hinsel Hospital, these three facilities. We have made an attempt to again remarket it at $7 a square foot. And I had a tenant, uh, they wanted one whole floor to open a marijuana clinic. And I said, if Riverside approves that, I have no problem with it. But they never got the license for that. Uh, there is a group of doctors, again, they were going to move in, they were going to take the whole floor, it's the uh, GI group at uh, McNeil. But it turns out to be, they ended up being bought out by McNeil, so they are moving in the building next door. Even next door building, which is McNeil building, is close to 40% empty right now. Items that I would like to see addressed before uh, any further consideration okay. of the rezoning. Mr. Pollock, uh, did you have anything else for Dr. Oh, Sheen? no. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Okay, questions. thank you very much. Okay. And can you speak up just a little bit, Doug? I'm having a hard time hearing you. 
And there's several items that I'd like to see addressed before uh, considering the rezoning request. Uh, one is this issue of bringing it into conformance. Um, Director, I have to mention the possibility of a variance if they can't bring it into conformance, and I would not agree with that. I think one of the findings of fact for a rezoning is that the property is suitable for this use. And if they can't meet the code, then why would we rezone it? So I would want to be, have, have assurances that if we did rezone it, that it will be brought into 100% compliance with building and zoning codes uh, relative to the site and the building. Uh, a bigger issue uh, and more related to what Trustee Sedevi was addressing, I would also like to really dig a little deeper into the options for redevelopment. I have no question in my mind that as is, offices aren't really the best use for that property. Uh, and, 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 but that's assuming it's as is with the, the building as is and, and there's, it's not redeveloped in some larger fashion. Uh, you know, and I'd wanna pursue that before we commit to this rezoning and the doctor puts money into the building and all that. Uh, I, the doctor mentioned that the McNeil office building next door is 40% occupied, is 40% vacant. So, and I know that McNeil was recently bought, the hospital was bought. I don't know if this building just shares the name or shares ownership or is related to that in any way, but I'd like a little bit more information about that and what the status of that building is. Uh, if it's you know, 40 percent vacant and, and dropping and the ownership is, is looking to sell, maybe there's an opportunity for a larger redevelopment here, um, you know, similar to what we pursued on uh, uh, at Long Common in Harlem or, or that type of redevelopment where properties are consolidated. Uh, you know, it may not be possible and we may come back in the end and say, you know, given the circumstances, uh, that the rezoning is appropriate, but until we really dig into that, I think we need to uh, kind of take take a step back and see if if there's an opportunity here for, to do something that would benefit the property owner as well as the village as a whole. Doctor, if you could, st I'm sorry, if you could step up, please. The hospital is taken up by Loyola Network, and the building is part of that, and the other clinics they have. Because I know the administration, I used to be chairman at McNeil for many years. So that is part of Loyola. They are going to change the logo outside, too. Do you have, do you have any idea what Loyola's intentions are with regard to the building? No, I, I don't know about that. Director App, did you do you have any input for that? I don't know what their plans are for the building. I know they are moving forward with bringing it under um, the Loyola umbrella. Um, they had their compliance inspection uh, for the property sale of that property to become, you know, Loyola's property. At this point, um, they have not filed any official documents, recorded them with the recorder's office, and they have not filed any specific petition with the assessor's office um, for tax exempt status for that property. So nothing has quite moved forward with that, but um, on an official basis, but you know, steps are being being taken by McNeil. Jesus. Uh, so I, I, I would agree with uh, Trustee Sedevi and Trustee Pollock. One, one question I do have for you. So you're exploring the idea of redeveloping it as for residential. Have you explored the idea of redeveloping it for commercial purposes? You know, I have not, I have not looked into that, but the problem is if you look at the property, it has a very narrow front. It's a very deep lot. So I don't know even if you built anything there, what will be commercial unless you maybe taken the building off and build something new. And even that may limit you. I think that that's, that may, again, which my thinking was, if you go down the street west of this building, there has been a number of new buildings built exactly in the same fashion, running north and south, you know, because the fronts have been smaller. 
there was actually a bowling alley there. West of me, an old bowling alley, you know, God knows yeah, from yeah, when. Victory. And they were trying to sell it as a commercial property. As I said, I've had interest in real estate. <laughs> and they couldn't, and eventually somebody bought it and ended up building these condominiums going from uh, south to the north. It's, it's a very pretty building, if you guys have seen that. So it, 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 it almost fashions according to the other buildings, going north and south, and you have enough room on the back. Thank you. Director Hatt. And, and I just uh, request it again, if you guys will consider this. One of the things I learned, these two towns, Riverside and Hinsdale, where I lived, are very common in keeping the quality of the neighborhood, quality of the homes. And I know absolutely very well that we would not be able to build anything which does not conform to the requirements of the town. I know that very well. Whether that's the variances, whether something came up and I thought about it, we will need actually 21 parking spaces because three Units will be one bedroom, and then the other will be two bedrooms. So if we end up that we don't have enough land, I'm very certain I, we do, because I building is on the back of my hand. I've lived, almost lived there for 37 years. Then let's say if we run short, that we don't have enough land to develop what we are doing, that we may actually convert three of the condominiums instead of two bedroom, one bedroom, we'll just convert that into two bedrooms. So they will become six and three, nine condos. So I thought about those things. I don't know all the architectural things. Once it comes to, you know, for the architectural review, the plan and all that, before it's submitted, I'm sure our, our architects will know what, what they need to do to bring it up to the requirement. Following up, following up on Mr. Pollock's concern about the bringing the building into conformity, if, if this was to become a zone for residential, would it have to meet the impervious surface requirements? Or is that only for single family homes? Uh, no, that's for all of the residential districts. So even in the R3 or R4 districts, um, we have impervious surface standards. It's, I this, believe, 65% be... in the R4 and 60% in the R3. But this, this would be what, B1TC is what the request is? He's requesting B1TC, and we don't have impervious requirements. So there is no impervious for, requirement for business for that. districts. Okay. Correct. Okay. That's what I need to know. So it's 100 by 236. Right. Other comments? Yes, I can, I can speak to it. I think one thing I do like about changing this to a condominium piece is it gives us a buffer between the homes that the gentleman spoke about in the backyards and the McNeil parking lot. I mean, in, in, in good historic planning, which we have here in Riverside, you always kind of step down from the single families to the multifamilies to the light, com light, res light business and then into the commercials, right? So it does kind of follow along a planning guideline, which helps a little bit of creating a buffer between the gentleman that spoke earlier in his backyard. Um, so that is a positive of it. On the economic side, I obviously can't disagree. I mean, obviously the piece of property, <clears throat> if it was currently rendering full occupancy, if it could do that. Obviously on the medical office building side, they're all going right next to the hospitals. That's the trend right now. All the hospitals are building new ones. So <clears throat> I understand your pain in trying to, in trying to market to that place. That it's just an old, uh, an old formula to have offsite doctor's offices these days. The trend may change, but who knows when that'll happen. Um, so I'm, I'm relatively neutral on it right now. I think there's positives and negatives. Um, but I do think that a little bit more time for Doug and you know, for Doug's conversation about trying to find some other opportunities is, is an option as well. Anybody else? Can we table it? Yes. Yeah, I mean, if you wanted. Uh, so if the, if the will of the, the majority of the board was to seek possible other options but didn't want to make the doctor reapply and start over by denying, it could be tabled to a date certain uh, 
at, you know, for instance, a month or maybe even two. You could do a month and then you could table it again if things were still being looked at and you weren't sure. That well, I just think that the, op so. I mean, the, the best benefit of this piece of property for the village would be to combine it if something was going to happen next door. Right? We learned, we learned that. But right. I think that's going to take some time. I mean, and that's why, I personally, from my perspective, I, I'm yeah. opposed to it uh, because of the fact that it's just too valuable from a commercial perspective. You need to table. Table. I mean, I would have to do that. That's right. Yes, sir, please. Can I just... <clears throat> you know, j just imagine, forget about... Oops. <laughs> forget about all the other issues. Just imagine being in my shoes. Anybody in my shoes. If you, half of your salary goes away every year losing in this building, I would try any possibility on the earth to change that. And believe me, I have. I have had people, you know, I have changed three realtors, you know, real estate companies, including one of the very famous ones, CB Commercial, no takers, you know. So I don't know if tomorrow there will be a new idea. I would love to hear from any one of you. I, ha I have no idea, except, you know, I'm, even here, the gentleman who talked about, that's a concern of mine too, will it be financially viable? But my feeling is, if I am losing $120,000, $110,000 a year, I walk away losing 50, I'm a winner. So I'm, I'm at that point. I just, that's the part I want to make it clear to you that I have tried any possible thing, even trying to sell the building to McNeil at one time, you know asking LaGrange Hospital if they want to expand this way. No takers so far. Uh, and what looks really so uh, ominous about, particularly the office buildings we are talking about, it, everybody's struggling, I know, all the way in Oak Brook Terrace, Oak Brook area, I don't know about Chicago downtown, I know mostly western suburbs. So, so I think if you consider that, that I have explored any imaginable option, unless you know anything better, I would love to entertain that. Thank you. Well, just, just to be clear, though, Doctor, that my understanding was you have only pursued offices and services and medical services. You have, you have not, for example, spoken with Loyola to see if they might be interested in some kind of joint development of those two parcels. You haven't reached out to commercial entities. You haven't reached out to franchisees, right? No, Loyola just actually came into picture right. uh, not long ago, but I've talked to McNeil. I've known a lot of people there over the years, and he's able to with the Adventists. Yeah, I've I mean, the, the, the struggle that, that we often have up here, and, and in our materials, one of one of the standards that we have to consider when we're considering changing zoning mm -hmm. really applies to your situation. And it says that the pr proposed amendment will benefit the residents of the village as a whole, and not just the applicant, property owner, neighbors, or any property under consideration. Mm -hmm. So while we can have all the empathy and appreciation for your personal situation, and we do, uh, to Mr. Sedeby's point, we have to take into consideration the possibility of greater good for the village as a whole. And what's one of, one of the things I think that's significant about this is that in 2009, a prior board specifically made this decision to, to, to zone this commercial. And I suspect for exactly the reasons that Mr. Sedvi and Mr. Gisa are articulating. So that's, that is the tension that, that we feel here. So if you, you know, if you're willing to to consider some of those other possibilities, then perhaps Mr. Pollock or Mr. Gisa would be willing to to give some time to do that. Yeah. Uh, but I'll leave that up to the yeah. to the trustees. The, the zoning to commercial was done by the village. Not I did not ask for that. That that was done by by whoever made the decision. Let, let me ask you this, and this was brought up by one of the person in zoning board, what if this building stays vacant another year? I'm sorry, and what if what? What if this building stays vacant for another year, another two years, another three years, what do we do then? Because that's what you go back and you're seeing already, that uh, our 
practice left because advocate moved us into Good Samaritan Hospital, there would be two and a half years it has had only 17% occupancy, literally, you know. I, I, underst yes, yeah, I so, understand. So what happens eventually, even looking from the point of view of the village, that the building is not in use at all. You know, I'll ask you this question one more time. Yeah. I don't know if I got the answer I, I really looked for the last time. When was the last time that you professionally put this on the market as a, um, office complex for rent by a, by a by a qualified realtor or that that works with finding you know renters or lawyers i mean not just throwing flyers in doctors offices looking for no, no, lawyers no. looking for dentists yeah. looking for various different other type of things other than whatever no no it has been through these realtor real Caldwell banker and then later we switch to for rent or purchase. It has been actually multiple listed for a number of years now, since since the uh, well, American there, Cancer I mean, I, Society. I, I drove by it today. There's no sign that says uh, vacancies. I mean, I, there's no there. You would drive by and you wouldn't know that there's. Okay, actually, I, I have pictures of that. That there were signs out there, and when we decided to go with the uh, converting it event. Even with the signs, we never got anybody asking us. Actually, it used to be a double angle sign. Uh, I have that Sperry, Sperry Van Ness was one of the companies they had listing, multiple listing for about close to two, eight, two years or so. Now, we have approached to that, not just the brochures. I thought the biggest market or biggest attraction will be being a fully handicapped building possible size elevator, the doctors will be more interested in that. that. I did that privately on my own, but we have listed this all along with the companies for multiple listing, yes. So, so when was the last time you had a contract, signed contract listing the property? That would be about a year and a half ago with, with uh, uh, Caldwell, Caldwell Bankers, and I ended that when I decided that we are going to try to see if we can get the zoning changed and convert that into anything else. In fact, when I talked to Sony, I said, could, could it be changed to commercial storage? So then I found out there is no clause for that. Just to, just to try to even see there could be use of building, and the Riverside has no zoning clause for commercial storage. So my answer to you will be that it was listed till about less than six months ago it was listed. And that was the third company. So currently we have a motion before us to approve the uh, recommendation by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Is anyone interested in an amendment or a table or Mr. Paul? Uh, I'm not sure what the correct parliamentary procedure is, but I'd like to make a motion to table this to the second board meeting in July. I will. I will. Or actually, it'd be the first meeting that. So this um, is the meeting in July. The meeting in July. Yeah, so right. we I would need second that. one second. We just need to make sure that we put a, a date right. certain on that. So, Mr. Pollock, do you, given given the what we're asking, do you think that's enough time? I, I don't know. It could be that that we come back and uh, could always table it again. again yeah. but, um, but out of consideration but for Dr. Sheik, perhaps it would be better to instead of requiring multiple visits, maybe we. I'm fine moving it further along. I, what 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 do you think, Mr. Lane, Mr. Lane, in terms of well, I mean, a reasonable amount of time to to explore <coughs> this yeah. redevelopment. I yes. mean, it sounds like the property standing what alone it, it sounds like the greatest opportunity for real commercial development would be in conjunction with the corner property right so that would take i mean i would think how about august 16th that's fine mr lumsden are you okay with that i would second tabling it to august 16th to do a little bit more research to see if there's an economic development that would would help the situation okay, who is going to do this research I would 
Well, my motion assumed that our, our staff would work with the property owner and, and as well as work independently uh, by contacting um, the owner of the McNeil office building next door and would pursue other, uh, you know, have other discussions and do other research to be able to come back to us and report on if they see any feasible options or just provide that additional information. Well, and, and in addition, I don't want to lose sight of Mr. Pollock's other point about the need to bring the building into conformity. That zoning, yeah. Conformity before before you can't, we, we should not, in my view, we should not set a precedent of rezoning property that isn't in conformity. So that, that will need to be addressed, and the doctor can work with Director Abt. So are we clear on the motion? I have that's the motion to table. Uh, consideration of the plan commission's recommendation to August 16th, 2018 board meeting. Please call the roll. Wait, wait can, I, is there, can I just ask, would course. it be appropriate to put this back with planning and zoning to pursue this? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it seems to me that we have moved beyond the commission and, and in many ways beyond the board level. This, this, this really is 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 going to fall on Dr. Sheik to see if this is a something feasible that can be accomplished, right. and 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 I think working with staff is probably the most efficient way to do that. I don't really know how the commission could could help in that. I, I just want to understand. I, I understand the zone, the uh, the variance and the and making sure that the, the building is in the code. That goes without saying we should delay this decision for that principle alone. But to de delay the decision to try to look at possible redevelopment, which is, I think, great, but who is going to do that? Are we putting, are we tasking Mr. Sheik with doing that? Follow Dr. Sheik, and if yes. we're, and how do we know that he, that he does this? If he doesn't, it will come back, and that will be the report to us on August 16th, and then we'll make an appropriate decision. What are we asking him to do? Are we asking him to, to list it with a realtor? Are we asking him to, I mean, I want to know we, what we're asking him well, to do. Well, I don't, I don't know that we have the, the authority to actually direct a property owner to do certain things. I think it's pretty clear from this discussion, I'm sure Dr. Sheik understands what we're saying here, that we want we want a broader examination of what could be possible in terms of redevelopment for the property. And Director Apt can certainly, she, she knows exactly what we're saying. So with, with her direction, then I think it, it will just have to wait and see what develops. But it seems, it seems tabling it, what, I mean, do we not have to vote whether or not, I mean, I don't think that converting these to, con I mean, my vote would be no for this ordinance, right? So what is tabling? What does tabling do for it? You're, you're tabling it for what reason? I know what I'm going to do during the tables. Sure. I'm going to talk to some of our planning and zoning commissioners because we're getting ready to do something totally in opposition to those guys. I want to better understand why they were unanimous in something that we're appearing to be unanimous in the opposite for it. What do they see? It's their, their I, I just think that I need to get my right. arms around that. If we're saying here that we are we're going to oppose P and Z for something, and we really don't have a good reason. We're saying, well, there might be a better economic opportunity for the greater good, but we don't know. I think we need time to have our staff help us know that. If there's an opportunity that that parcel is going to just continue to linger on with Loyola or whoever the medical organization is, and there is no opportunity to development, then that needs to be known by us. We're making an assumption that we're going to gain some tax revenue, which is the greater good, that's better than 12 condominiums capital. I don't think I'm in a position to make that yet. Yes, yeah, see, I, I, and I, I respect yeah. that, but I'm, I'm completely on the other opposite end of the spectrum of that. I find no reason to drag the doctor along and, and string him along if, if I feel very comfortable voting against it. And the reason I feel comfortable voting against it is because we've got Harlem and Ogden, which are our most the greatest opportunities we have, and they're, they're littered with residential condominiums and townhomes, and I think that that is a major flaw in the village of Riverside. But that's my opinion, so, yeah. I agree. Can I, can I respond to that? Uh, Loyola is going to actually become tax exempt once they take that, so they have no reason. 
they have a wonderful building and a lot less expense on that. You know, the hospitals have a lot bigger pockets too that they can absorb the losses. If this seems to make any sense to you, I will, it's a miracle if it sells in that time, I'll be happy. I can go back and relist with Caldwell Banker, who are the largest uh, office commercial realtors, you know, for renting and also selling with both the options, and even trying to get less money if I can walk away without losing any money. If it sells, then obviously we don't have this issue here. We can go two months. I can bring all the proof if you guys want to that we did list, and they will have all the responses by Caldwell Banker, what kind of response they had. Then that may put all of us, means all of you and me, in a better position to make a decision because we eventually have to find use of this building, what we are going to do, regardless, you know, whether I'm using money or not. Okay. Hey, I understand that. Thank you, Doctor. I appreciate that. Thank you. If you guys feel comfortable with that, if that's what you want me to do, I don't mind you giving me directions, you know, as I'm not an attorney, I'm just like your neighbor, an average guy, and I, I'm looking for guidance too. So the motion before us is to is to table this until August 16th. Please Correct. call the roll. Well, I, I, I still have, I still have some thoughts. Um, I, I just think we have a unique set of circumstances here, and I'm going. I, I haven't even figured out in my own mind yet what I want to do. I, I was leaning towards what Mr. Trustee Gisa was saying, but we do have a unique set of circumstances here, and Loyola's plans could be they're going to fill it up. If they fill that building up, then you have a different calculus on filling your building up. Or they might determine it's surplus real estate and they want to get rid of it. And I think, like we've talked about, we don't, until we know those answers, I think it probably does behoove us to continue it so we don't just close the door and, and yeah. make him reapply. However, having said that, I am dubious, and I, and I don't think that there's a feasibility study that could ever be commissioned that would say that the highest and best use of that site is what's proposed. It's clearly in the best interest of the, of the owner. I, I agree with that, and I appreciate you know, what you've done and what you're trying to do, um, but that's what I'm struggling with. I mean, I agree with that. The, the, I think the tension here is, I think any urban planner anywhere would tell you, as Trustee Sebi has said, that you don't want to have peripheral streets residential. Yeah. Uh, however, that's that's kind of the theory. That's the abstraction. Then you also have the actual circumstances on the ground, which we've all talked about. But uh, it seems to me that a, a, a you know little time here to see a little more investigation with both regard to the conformity and to the marketability of the project makes some sense. So anything else? Call the roll, please. Wait, what are we voting? We are voting, we are voting <laughs> on the table. We're voting to table, the table, to table to August table 16th. Table to so August. Is the prior motion withdrawn? Correct. No. Well, it's, no, it's not withdrawn. We're, we're just going to table it, right? No, no, no. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what Ms. Haley means is the prior motion to approve that got the discussion started. It was never formally repealed. She's saying, well, we're going to view that as withdrawn, the original motion to approve, before I, our discussion started. Right. We, we had a motion in a second to approve. To approve. So now we're just tabling that decision till August 16th. We're not withdrawing the motion. Well, okay, you could look at it that way. It's to, I, what, I, what I viewed it as motion to table consideration of the recommendation from the plan commission, but you could say we're tabling the discussion on the motion to approve. You could do that. Yeah. That's fine. That's, okay. okay. That's fine. Yeah. Um, Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Giza. Nay. Trustee Lumsden. Aye. Trustee Ballerine. Aye. Trustee Sedeby. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Doctor. We wish you the very best for this. We'll see you in two months again. Pardon me? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Next up is a resolution adopting the Village of Riverside Park Bench donation policy. Mr. Bailey. See if this is any simpler than some of these <laughs> previous items before us. This is uh, something that's been returned to your agenda from your May 3rd meeting agenda. 
Uh, there was a fair amount of discussion about a park bench policy. Uh, hopefully I've captured your comments and have kind of turned it into a park bench donation policy. It now makes, uh, put, really puts all park benches in play, either for installation of a new bench, replacement of a, an existing bench, or installation of a plaque on an existing bench. The cost of all three would be $2,500. That uh, amount of money would go into a park maintenance fund a bench fund and um, the uh, language on the plaques would be limited could only be in memory of or uh, in recognition of and the village would exercise final um, approval of or over any language so I, I hopefully I captured what you folks were uh, um, suggesting during your last uh, discussion I'd ask for a motion to approve the resolution as drafted. So moved. Mr. Ballerine. Second. Mr. Chisa. Comments? Please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Chisa. Aye. Trustee Lumsden. Aye. Trustee Ballerine. Aye. Trustee Sedeby. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you for hanging in there for three hours, <laughs> Mr. Bailey. Next up is a resolution authorizing the use of quality-based selection process for the award of contracts for engineering services on projects or portions of projects involving the use of federal funds and adopting a policy and procedures related to the same. Director, I'm sorry, Manager Francis. Uh, no, it's Director Bailey. Oh, it is Director Bailey. Yes. You're doing this one also? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Back on. Right. Um, <laughs> federal Highway Administration has adopted rules that require communities that are using federal funds uh, for uh, road projects that um, would exceed $20,000 in engineering fees, and we're talking about phase three engineering, which is really the construction phase of these projects, to go through a quality-based selection process where the um, community recipient of the funds has to advertise for these uh, phase three engineering services. Um, this policy establishes a committee um, that would be involved in reviewing and making a recommendation to the village board um, for um, engineering phase three engineering engineering services and this would be in each each project that comes along doesn't matter who the village engineer is or who did phase one and phase two F for phase three uh, the village is required to uh, go through this competitive selection process so this, uh, this is a policy here that really sets in place the uh, process for doing that. So I'd ask for a motion to approve the resolution as drafted. We have it. We can't talk to you Well, you just need a motion first. Yeah, I'll motion. By Mr. Lumsden. Mm -hmm. Second by? Second. By Mr. Chisa. Mm -hmm. Now you have So this is required to get the funding, right? Right, it's a condition yeah. of the funding. Yeah. And it's coming from a Federal Highway Administration from which all this funding really comes from. Yeah, it doesn't SDP. limit what your choice is, ultimately. Yeah, no, but but the QBS process, the process works well, but right. just, I just want everybody to really, we really don't have it. If we want to get funding from these sources, we have to agree with this policy to do QBS, right. or we can just say no thanks right. to the money. That's what we want to do. Right. right. So, <laughs> I, I have a follow-up question, though. Why would this only apply to projects that require federal funding? Why would it not apply to all projects over a certain threshold? These are uh, Federal Highway Administration rules, you know, and they, you know, that's where a lot of the funding that we use for street improvement projects really comes from the federal government, Federal Highway Administration. It's administered by IDOT, um, and that's why you see a lot of the documents, a lot of the agreements are IDOT documents. but. The Federal Highway Administration, for whatever reason, I'm not sure they're, for their motivation, that this is a, uh, you know, a, new, a new regulation that they've enacted. But and you that, don't think this is best practices for competitive bidding all large projects? I guess that's where I'm well, struggling. Well, competitive bidding is quality-based, so yes. you can't negotiate the price necessarily. So, yeah, as a matter of fact, you're not negotiating right, price. Right. Yeah. With engineering services or professional services, you can't negotiate price. That's kind of the last piece. Right. 
So this, this, this ties in, or it doesn't ties in, but it's related to a law that was passed several years ago by the state that applies to, to non-home rule municipalities where in order to choose a professional service like an engineer, you need to do, where this wasn't required before by law, you need to do a selection process asking for responses to, for, or for responses that include qualifications, a request for qualifications. And then you can choose a professional from that. But there's an exception in the law for communities that had an established established relationship with a professional, right? So then you don't need to follow. The idea is that if you're choosing someone new, you need to not just pick the person because for any reason, he's your cousin-in-law or whatever. Uh, you need to go through a process, but it does recognize that professional relationships are based also on qualifications and trust, and that if you have a, a relationship, that can be honored. This kind of goes beyond what the state law uh, and requires this sort of process, not just one time, revisiting it whenever you feel it's necessary, but for each, each time, which could get a bit cumbersome in a professional relationship. It's not like where you're gonna buy your widgets. So it could be a little cumbersome to do all the time, but it is required for these projects. realize the requirements of us going through four different funded projects, especially when it's grant funded. Even when it's not grant funded, we have to go through IHPA, the Illinois Historical Preservation Association, or agency rather, and so that requires a number of things that need to be done for cultural clearance for us to even proceed with the project. And so if a firm doesn't have familiarity with that, that can pose a number of hurdles for the village. Also continuity of services when you're switching firms. Plus we just don't have the staff to do an RFQ each time we have a new project. So those are all things to be considered. Well, I'm well, saying, no, I'm I'm saying with regard for every Going project, beyond what this what requires. This that was the question from Trustee Sedeby. Why wouldn't we do this? Why would we just do it when it's required? Yeah. And those are, that was the answer. Anything else? Please call the roll. Trustee Powell. Aye. Trustee Jesus. Aye. Trustee Lumsden. Aye. Trustee Ballerine. Aye. Trustee Sedgwick. Aye. Motion carries. I would just suggest, given the time of the evening, that we uh, postpone our consideration about bike rack placements to a future meeting. Is that okay with everyone? Unless it's just burning in your souls. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we have no new business. Uh, we have no need for an executive session. I'd ask for a motion and a second to adjourn. So moved. By Mr. Lumsden. By Mr. Gisa, please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Gisa. Aye. Trustee Lumsden. Aye. Trustee Ballerine. Aye. Trustee Sedeby. Aye. Meetings adjourned. Thank you and good night.